All right, brother Islam, welcome. I never knew TV. Yes, right? sir. Appreciate you coming out. Um, before we even get into the reasoning, there are two things I want have to ask you. Right, first is, um, you got to share those study habits. <laughs> right, share the study habits <laughs> um, for the brothers and sisters, so they can increase their accumulation, understanding, and retention of information. What is your, uh, how would I say? Yeah, what is your habit to gain so much information and retain it? Mm. First thing, um, I never go past any word or symbol that I do not fully understand. First key when uh, understanding how the brain works. So when you go past a word or symbol you do not understand, the mind shuts off to a degree because it cannot compute that. It doesn't know how to reason with it. It doesn't know how to calculate it. So you have to get a simple dictionary. Make sure you know the definitions of the word. Now, each word has multiple definitions, especially in the English language. So you have to know the exact context in which the word is being used. You have to know how to apply that definition. I make at least 10 sentences with that definition of the word. Then I make sentences with all the rest of the definitions to have a full understanding. So for example, the word to, T-O, has over 50 definitions. So you know you can understand how much work that would take, but it helps you to retain it to apply it and then how to understand when it comes to communication and then know how to use it in different conversations, depending on who you're talking to. And just information on the whole in regards to uh, current events, because I could say personally, I do very good on history. But yes. When it comes to current events, I'm not up to date like I should be. Uh, the reason why current events are tricky is because there are so many and there are so many different sources. So while people are rushing to give out information, you have a large percentage who give out information prematurely on current events. So then they miss the mark. Some of them may have 20% factual information, maybe 50% factual, even maybe 75 or 80. But then there's that 20, 30 or 40% that's still not certain because things are still ever evolving. Then you have some that wait. They wait until all the facts come out, then they give a full report. So you have to find out what source to look at. The source you have to look at has to have a long protracted record of having the most factual data. So you left, look at their record. That's when people say, what is your credible source? Meaning what source are you utilizing that has the longest standing record of being factual throughout history, throughout its existence, throughout its reporting? And or I would say it's journalistic approach. OK, so you have to look at it in, in these ways. Now, a lot of people, you know, we're mentally lazy now. So even with me saying what I just said, people are like, man, I ain't got time to do all that. OK, well, then don't talk then. <laughs> don't don't get out here. Don't say anything because it takes a lot because there are so many people with microphones, so many people with cameras and platforms that they're really saturating the market. Like everybody's irresponsible talking. Irresponsible too, you know? Oh, very, quite, yeah, very irresponsible. A lot of people just talking because now it's about likes and views and creating something or being the first one to release information when you shouldn't want to be the first, you should want to be the correct one or the person just to present the facts. That's why I would just say it this way. Minister Farrakhan always says, check your motive. We must always check our motive. I'm not interested in being the first. I was at a certain point in my, you know, immaturity when it comes to knowledge and information. I have grown out of that, thankfully, and I'm still growing. And I think we should all do the same thing because people live based off of what they hear. So when you get out here and jump and you throw some information out there, people will literally take what you said if they trust you and they will try to live their life based off of that. And a lot of people have made horrible mistakes because of the improper use of information. Elon Musk posted to social media platform X. I got to get used to saying that X, right? Mm -hmm. X on Tuesday. Uh, America is going full joker, referring to the recent looting in Philadelphia. Um, I find it out when billionaires are people who contribute to income equality, criticize the decline of the society. Uh, I think we should stop using or stop freezing what is occurring in America as the decline of the empire. And I rephrase it as just a natural progression of capitalism. Hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts about this? Very interesting how Elon Musk, being a multi-billionaire, would come out and say something so cavalier, so immature. I'll say it that way. Um, again, it's very interesting when I see people with that amount of money. They're very biased and they make it obvious who their culture is, who they support, what they do, what they believe in. I don't hear him say that about the people when they win football games, the soccer riots, all of those things that happen all across the country when these things really happen, where they do the same amount, if not more, flipping over cars, breaking into stores, looting, and all of that in their joyous, jubilant expression of how happy they are about a game being won, et cetera, or the, their opponent losing. But when it comes to black folks looting, et cetera, which is not right, it's not proper, we shouldn't do that. 
we have to thoroughly understand what causes these situations to occur in every culture, everywhere. That's the main thing. Look at the why, address the cause, and present a solution for that. If you have multi-billions, okay, then you should present a solution rather than complaining about it as if, well, these are just animals. Because if they were white, let's just be very clear, if they were of the European or Caucasian persuasion, there would be more of a, let me see how I can assist or let me see what programs exist in that area for me to fund, or let me find out the mayor of the city if he needs any help. That's normally how it goes. Um, and so I'm not really mad per se, it's just, again, we have to check people when they're wrong. So on that platform, which again, I was allowed back on X, you know, it's now called X, formerly known as Twitter, after being kicked off by Jack Dorsey from the request of 12 US Attorney Generals by the White House, I was taken off. Elon Musk took over the, the, um, the app and put myself back on, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on, and 10 others. So I appreciate the freedom of speech, but I don't necessarily entirely trust Elon Musk for that example and for others. They're very biased, and truth is not a universal thing, not entirely, even though some people may believe. And uh, what are your thoughts about this idea when people refer to America as the Roman Empire in regards to its decline? Um, I just think that we need to acknowledge this is the natural progression of capitalism. Mm -hmm. The reason I say that as capitalism becomes uh, more mature within a society, people do anything to get the money, meaning kind of disregarding any moral fiber or principles they had. And I think that's kind of like what we're seeing. Absolutely. It's interesting how he mentioned the fall of the empire because that is a very, very accurate echoing of what has taken place in the past. America, we know, is the modern Rome. It is the modern Babylon. It is the modern Sodom and Gomorrah. As a matter of fact, Rome, Babylon, and Sodom and Gomorrah don't really have nothing on America, to be honest with you, um, as it pertains to the debauchery, the degenerate behavior, the influence, because now we have technology. We have the ability to broadcast influential images, pictures, directives in an instant. Rome, it took time to conquer, it took time to spread, but America is quite literally that modern form of all of those combined. And so her fall was foretold. It is systemic, it is, it's prophetic. It's going to happen, it was destined to happen. Um, and everything that was in Rome is now in America. Everything that was in Greece and Rome, the Greco-Roman culture, they brought everything from pedophilia to the Colosseums to all of that behavior, they brought it over here. And even America gives credit to I believe Athens, Greece, she refers to Athens, Greece as the mother of Western civilization. So she acknowledges that area as it pertains to the adoption of her cultural practices here. So this is the child of that area. So for it to be the fall, well, you're just acknowledging what was supposed to happen because you adopted the same practices and the same behavior. So again, it's just very interesting, but to say the fall is because of a few black folks who are robbing a few stores or breaking a couple stores, I'm sorry. Uh, no, you, you're not gonna look at the Federal Reserve Act. You're not gonna look at slavery. You're not gonna look at all of the horrible things that you have done to human beings all across this nation and the planet. The modern, uh, I would say, neo-colonialist movement with over 700 military bases in multiple countries right now to where you have conquered in the name of the West, in the name of democracy. Uh, it's, just, it's just very sad to see how many people don't know basic history. And they try to say, because of these few black folk in this little area right here, breaking into a few stores again, which is not right. Um, that is not the cause of the fall. The cause of the fall is your deviation from logic, your embrace of evil and wicked behavior, your embrace of a socioeconomic system that destroys human beings and how you use economics to leverage more slavery practices. And over and over again, the modern day slave system with prison industrial complexes and how they are overly capitalistic. Capitalism does have a certain place depending on how you use it ethically and morally, but they are overly capitalistic, meaning cutthroat dollar over everybody. And that's where this fall is coming from, a deviation from God, a deviation from morals, a deviation from ethics. So I think they should be a little more humble before opening their mouth and trying to blame everything on a few black folk, you're basically attacking your victim. <laughs> you're not taking any kind of responsibility or holding yourself accountable. On this topic of fall of America, how accurate was or is the book still exists, Elijah Muhammad's book, Fall of America? The Fall of America, brother, I will say word for word is absolutely accurate from a biblical standpoint, a Quranic standpoint, a historical standpoint, scientific standpoint, and even a monetary standpoint because he even addressed after the dollar goes down, the government is going to go down behind the dollar. 
he specifically talked about the Federal Reserve Act. And after America went off the gold standard in the 1913 area, 1913, 1914 Federal Reserve Act, then after that, you're talking about going off the gold standard. Then you're talking about the 1930s, roughly around that time, an adjustment was made in the 1970s, where with Nixon totally, you know, axing out the gold circumstance to where now it's like, well, wait a minute, you have debt, you have the economy that is over $33 trillion in debt, which that's just one chunk of it. It's actually over $60 trillion. Now you're having more people come in. You're having more debt. You're having all this money go to the Ukraine, all this money go here and there to where the debt ceiling is going to collapse. The dollar is so weak now to where it, you could you could just kick it and the whole thing will fall over, brother. I mean, it's really, it's horrible. So the most honorable Elijah Muhammad should have been listened to. The wise people did listen to him. That's why people started investing in gold, buying up land, you know, finding ways to have tangible assets because they already knew that what he was saying back then was going to come to pass. He absolutely was and is right and exact. I recently went to Whitney Plantation in Louisiana, right? Mm -hmm. It was a bugged out experience. Um, from there, right, I really came up to this point that uh, we need to change the narrative how we view slavery. Um, not saying we should celebrate slavery, mm -hmm. but we should celebrate our ancestors, um, their brilliance, courage, creativity, resilience. And what I found most impressive was their ability to still love uh, despite the hardships of life. And I notice many people now are unable to have love in their heart when life gets them. You know, so I think we need to have an approach for the ancestors in regards to like <clears throat> their greatness. And we Absolutely. need to uh, apply those attributes to our life today. And that's what we need to focus on. I think the focus is on something that's, um, I won't say pointless, but not beneficial. Mm -hmm. And we need to change the focus on what they experienced and what they did that we could utilize it to be empowered to do great things. You know, there's a balance that we need to have <clears throat> when it comes to learning our history. You know, the suffering of our people is something that is definitely needed. Uh, it's thorough to be aware of so that we can truly understand, overstand, and understand exactly what took place. Because if you know exactly what your people were up against and for them to still overcome, then you can predict how much pressure you can actually handle. You don't know what you can handle because you don't know what they went through. We think what we're going through right now is hard. <laughs> we... Or we got we we are living in heaven compared to what they went through Facts. and i mean like really went through but again if you're detached from that history if you're detached from exactly that knowledge then of course everything will irritate you everything will seem difficult i noticed how we are heavily taught to study everyone else's suffering everyone else's history how they overcame how they pushed through how they persevered uh, and that's perfectly fine to learn about everyone else. That's what an intelligent person is supposed to do. But you never learn about others' history before you learn about your own. If you do that, you are backwards because you then become more connected to others than you do to yourself. You then learn to love others more than you get to love yourself. You become more concerned about the plight and what situations and different things about everybody else before yourself. You have to work from the inside out rather than the outside in. So when I looked at that, brother, um, even studying the different plantations. Most of our people have never been to a plantation and they still exist. Many of them in a historical sense, you know, where they've documented it, they've, they've mapped it off as these homes for people to go and study for historical purposes. But then you have modern buildings, a lot of them right now that people have turned into Airbnbs and bed and breakfasts. And these used to be the slave quarters. I couldn't believe that. I'm like, okay, hold on. <laughs> This, this should not be a place where you can go and hang out and watch Netflix. Like that, that, that's not, that is not how we pay homage to our ancestors. That's not how you bring your people to go and look at and be in the spirit to really feel what took place. I can't do that when you don't transform this thing into another way of making money. You made money one way, now you make money another way. You justify, well, I mean, this piece of property. No, 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 no. If we were Jewish, you couldn't do that. Let's make this clear. If we were a Chinese and that was one of their historic, horrible areas, you couldn't do that. At least they would memorialize it. They would, get, they would put statues up showing the strength of their people. Something that demonstrates the perseverance, the end of that chapter, at least. Um, and that's something that we need to focus on, definitely, because at this point, brother, we don't love ourselves that much because we were not able to look at exactly how our people did love one another by pushing through what they went through at that time. If we could look at that and say, we still were able to get married during slavery, we still stood up for our woman 
during slavery, we still fought for our children as much as we could when the odds were totally against us, legally against us. The police forces were against us. The slave master was against us. The whole environment was completely programmed to believe that we were beneath that of human beings, less value than that of a dog. And we still push through. So at this point, we don't have nothing to argue about. We created nonsense because we don't have smoke for the real enemy that destroyed us. So we want to attack one another. It makes no sense to me. So finding the love for one another starts with us looking at the history of how our people found love for each other during the most horrific time in our history. And there are two more things I want to touch on. Um, one, in the area of love in regards to, first of all, just an area of terror. Like there's no mm -hmm. one to help. I don't think people understand, like there's literally no one there to help you. There's no, there's nowhere to run. There's no one to protect you from the abuse that you're experiencing, right? Mm -hmm. People still went to other plantations to see loved ones. Yes. What I found very interesting is those who rebelled that were born into slavery. I'm not talking about the group that came over now because they, you know, they haven't been indoctrinated. They're in a situation, but they're not, they haven't been broken mentally. Experience so they're more different. rebellious, right? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about somebody that's been there fifth, fourth, sixth generation and they decide to rebel. Um, I don't think, I'm not getting deep into history. I don't think their rebellion, when they did their rebellion, they were thinking they were going to end slavery. I think it was just the fact of I won't deal with this anymore. And that mm -hmm. also needs to be acknowledged to be in that environment to get to that point. Absolutely. Um, there's one more thing I want to touch on with the slavery vibe is the um, I think that was it, man. You were saying the overcoming the perseverance. Um, yeah. Um, Basically, the, the yeah, success. I think it was after. Was <laughs> well, I can I, I'll touch on this point. What I find interesting is we had a larger push of evolution and improvement within the first 10 years out of slavery than we did within the last 100 years. You're talking about between 1865 and 1877, the reconstruction era where we became, we went back to school, became senators, we became lawyers and teachers and doctors and all of this within the first decade after. Blew everybody's mind. They were like, how in the hell? You weren't reading. You were not, how did you, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> These people couldn't believe how we bounced back so quick. It's like, wait a minute. We were able to do in a decade what they prevented us from doing in three centuries. That makes no sense to two groups of people or to a mindset that made you think you were inferior, that made everyone believe you were inferior, that you put in scientific literature, you were inferior, you put in historical books and writings and plays, that you were inferior. This Go ahead. The next thing I wanted to touch on, that's what I forgot. This whole notion of uh, slaves not being humans. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. We have to have a conversation. Either you were practicing bestiality or you didn't believe or you you get what I'm saying? Because Absolutely. I can't get an erection with a beer, a dog, a cat, anything like that. Come on. There was a lot of sex yes. happening in that environment, bro. Yes. Not all forced. Yes, mm -hmm. there was rape, but there were a lot of mutual relationships. Mm -hmm. So I question the psyche of the person in regards to the lies that they said and the internal conflict they must have had because they're words and actions don't correlate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know you know it it is a fetish the relationship that we have had uh, with the european during the time of slavery it has been more of a fetish because you can't on one hand dehumanize a group of people justify them being inhumane say these are animals these are not human beings we are not the same don't touch me you have a disease oh my god ugh stay outside, you belong with the dog, the pig, et cetera, and then turn around and sneak in the barn and come lay down with me. Something ain't making sense here. So either you have a misunderstanding or you're not being honest about what your culture is and how you truly view me. In Europe currently right now, you have over 100,000 self-identifying zoophiles, over 100,000 people who identify as those who have intimate relations with animals currently, right now. Over 100,000 of them. That is not a new practice. It's a very old practice. When it came to us as a people, many of them believed on the bug breaking farms, on the sex farms, that they were having sexual relations with their dog, their horse. This is how many of them were picturing it. And that's how they were going into that that mentality. Oh, so some of them were practicing bestiality then? Absolutely. Oh, all right then. All right. Oh, that no. Be, oh, oh right. please. Oh, yeah. Right. No, yeah. <laughs> bestiality is a part of the culture. Same as pederasty with the pedophilia circumstance. That is a part of Caucasian 
culture, primarily Greco-Roman culture that has been transferred into multiple European nations. Then of course you have some things in Asia, but primarily with the Europeans, how they brought it over here, resoundingly, that's exactly what they have done. It, it has been a very well-known practice, but they try to stomp it out of history. So during that time, it made sense why there was this fetishizing of its, its black bodies. Um, you know, the Delectable Negro, that book, not just about how they cannibalistically were indulging in us as far as eating us, but how they actually thought of us as a group, you know, especially when it comes to the Caucasian woman with the black male. But then on the other end, you have the bed winches or bed warmers, you know, our sisters who would sleep with the white men for whatever, survival, to not have her child sent to another plantation, to not have her husband bug broken, whipped or killed, or because she actually did fall in love with the slave master. That did happen, which was horrible and that did exist, and vice versa. These things are what we have to thoroughly analyze because that mentality is not gone. That's another thing that people have to look at. It's not gone. And people don't want to look at it because they, want, they don't want to admit what they are actually dealing with today. They don't want to look at some of the relationships today. All of a sudden, you've been married to this Caucasian male for 10, 15 years. Then all of a sudden, he gets mad enough, he calls you the N-word. And you think, wait a minute, he's never called me that before. Well, did you really talk about the historical underpinnings of your relationship as a people? Did you find out exactly what you've been through? So you got to be honest. People have to look at the record. You look at a person's record when it comes to credit. You look at a person's record when it comes to if you want to borrow money or let them borrow your money. You look at the person's record when it comes to all these things. But when it comes to what our people have been through with other people, love is love. Let's just get past it. Let's move on. You know what's wild, man? People always talk about like epigenetic and trauma oh, genes and history. So if that's true, which it is true <laughs> scientifically, right? And you're grandparents or great grandparents used to conduct themselves or have that view of a particular person how many generations would it take regardless of what society you're in how long would it take for that to get out of your psyche <laughs> regardless of how deep it is back there mm -hmm. well you brought up epigenetics and epigenetics deals with a lasting trace on a cellular level it deals with patterns it deals with behaviors it deals with um a practice of different cultural narratives and behaviors of a human being. It deals with quite literally, I behave this way because my great, 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 great grandfather behaved this way. It is a possibility. And they have discovered scientifically that that is possible all the way down to even uh, different fears. Even for example, when it comes to us in the police, modern police, a lot of us have never had, you know, a lot of us I have, but a lot of us have not had those life or death situations with police. Some of us may have just had, you know, been pulled over, here's a ticket, etc. But that that fear has been in a lot of our people, even when they have never had that life or death situation. Because it is possibly for many of us an epigenetic factor because of what our ancestors went through dealing with the plantations or the slave catchers or the modern day police. But back then they were on horses, now they're in cars with horse power. It is a very simple thing that we have to look at and be honest about and, and look at it again. A wise people look at their history to find out what worked, what didn't work, adopt the successful actions, get rid of the unsuccessful ones. Look at what behaviors helped us, look at what behaviors didn't. Look at what triggered us, look at what didn't. We got to look at that, bro. We have to analyze ourselves. Like really, you know, we don't need to go to a psychologist over there to analyze you. <laughs> you need to sit down, read some books, talk to your parents and your grandparents, whoever's in your family, and learn the history of your family so that you know exactly what your family's been through. A lot of us would be very shocked to know that we were connected to more revolutionaries in our family in the, in the past than we could ever imagine. Because I know I, when I learned about a lot of my family from Boston, some, some riders, some revolutionaries, you know, so it helped me to realize why I am the way I am today. Give you that fire. Oh, come on. It, and and it, it makes you feel stronger, but that's the importance of learning the history. So that, that whole thing dealing with slavery, brother, the balance, not just the suffering and the horrible negative things, but learn about how we pushed through, became inventors and innovators, engineers, architects. We built all of this right out of slavery. Every single thing, roughly, or I would say at least 90%, 95% of what we use today. Everything dealing with technology and you know computers and the stoplight, the gas mask, refrigerated everything, computer chips, GPS, all of this, black innovation, black folks the minds of our people right outside of slavery. We have to do more movies about black inventors and less about slavery. We got enough about slavery, but we should also even refine the ones about slavery to be more accurate, more historically on point. But I would say we should balance out every slave movie with at least five movies about black inventors. 
I think that'll be a pretty good balance. I once heard you saying, I'm paraphrasing. I want to be clear. You have to be very careful with this right now. Yes, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> um, you said social media is a gift and a curse for people and the government, right? Mm -hmm. um, can you explain what you meant by that? Absolutely. Social media being a gift and a curse for the people and for the government is in different layers. Number one, it's a gift for the people because we have an ability to access widespread instant communication with virtually anyone across the planet. For the government, however, it is a gift because while we utilize this via or this technology, we're also giving them free access to our thoughts, to our phones, to our history, to our you know, contacts, messages, and everything that we have, <laughs> roughly our pictures, our videos, at the same time. So it is a gift and a curse on both ends. How will you use it? Will you use it to be wise and beneficial to yourself, beneficial to your family, your people, to the mission of uplifting, inspiring, creating, or will you just do something that's gonna be self-incriminating? Put yourself in a bad position. You're gonna get caught up with some RICO charges. You're gonna be around the wrong people. What are you gonna do? So you have to be, be mindful that they have not ended their spying mechanism. They have not ended their data collection. As a matter of fact, you're talking about a system that collects over 20 million phone calls every day, over 30 million text messages a day, over 15 million emails a day. They are not stopping their data collection or the data collecting. According to Edward Snowden and according to uh, Glenn Greenwald, America has never stopped. They have to do what they're doing in order to maintain the metadata and the overall data because that also generates power for what they do. The information sharing. Right now, it's who has the most information going in and out. That is where they make a large percentage of money, quite literally. So you, you have to look at how you're feeding the machine and how the machine is feeding you. How we use it is the key. It's really critical of how we use it. As of right now, the technology has evolved so much, they are looking at going into technological ways of implanting things within the body, within the brain, so that you no longer have to use a phone to text, use computers to type. You'll be able to do it mentally through a chip into the metaverse or another verse or whatever type of you know uh, mainframe that they have. It, it's, no, it's no joke. Like, it's really no joke. Every movie that we've seen from Total Recall to Terminator, all of them are not just movies. They were documentaries to one degree or another, and also because Hollywood contracts with the military, so they were really normalizing certain things so that when they come into activity, we won't see them as being an evolution of a military type of complex or a technological complex. We will see it as, oh, that's just that movie y'all saw because we don't know how to differentiate between fact and fiction. So there's a lot of things taking place here um, when it comes to that, but a gift and a curse is a very simple thing. Do not feed the machine. Use it to benefit you and your people. Be wise of how you use it, but do not put anything in there that is going to come down you, down on you or put you in a negative position in the long run. There's a bridge in here, Republican candidate, Mr. Ramaswamy, I'm not sure, I apologize oh, yeah. for mm -hmm. uh, pronouncing his name wrong, um, has criticized social media platforms and described their products as addictive. He even recently called TikTok digital fentanyl, right? <laughs> um, I've seen, I've witnessed uh, the whole social media has on children, obviously mm -hmm. from working with children. The question I have for you, do you believe young people are mature enough to use social media in a productive and healthy way? Oh man, good question, very good question. Well to the first point, Mr. Ramaswamy, um, although he did criticize you know, accurately. As a matter of fact, multiple candidates have criticized accurately social media. The danger of it is that it's not stopping. It is going nowhere. You make money from it. You get high off of it with communication. You see all the pictures you always want to see, the videos you want to see, and then on the other end, you get tutorials. You know how to build things. You know how to do. Come on, that dopamine is quick. It's a quick shot, brother. Heroin ain't got nothing on social media. It's really a, an interesting thing. It's right there in your face. You could do it. Hey, everybody got one. It's something that we have to be mindful of because this generation cannot be mature enough to utilize that while at the same time being too immature to read a book, too mature to go and have critical thinking when it comes to government affairs or history and things like that. They're not mature enough to know what's really going on in the world, but you're telling me they're mature enough to handle thousands of scrolls thousands of pieces of metadata flying at them, information flying at them, and their mind is just overwhelmed all day long with all kinds of concepts, ideas, videos, pictures. No, they are being heavily indoctrinated and normalized to absorb high amounts of information that 
over 70% roughly is not even useful. So imagine eating donuts all day, but then you take some vitamins, 1,000 milligrams vitamin C, or you're like, well, look, I ate an apple, but you ate 25 donuts. And you mean to tell me you, you, you're healthy? No, you are unhealthy mentally, and then it leans into the negative circumstances when it comes to young girls committing suicide, young boys, primarily black boys committing suicide because they're comparing themselves to all these images of people, unrealistic images, AI images, heavily brushed and filtered images of people on social media because they think that's life. So there's a lot of it that demonstrates they are not mature. The vast majority are not mature. The adults ain't mature. The children ain't mature. Most of the people are not mature because they don't even realize it's a monster that was created that they're dealing with. But they think it's their friend. You get up on Facebook every morning and say, good morning, Facebook. You got people really treating social media like it's their friend. Like it's the, the best friend they ever had, not realizing you're giving your life to this thing. And some people are so addicted to it that they have committed suicide the moment their social media goes down. I've been taken down from Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, all of them by the U.S. government. Brother, I didn't bat an eye. I went to the gym, did some prayer exercise and kept moving and kept doing the work. But you have some people who literally have taken their life because they think their life was taken because their social media was. You know, it's wild, man. Like, people always talk about, like, this virtual world. And, like, we're already in it, bro. Yeah. We're already in it. And yes. uh, one more thing I want to touch on with the social media, what I notice is that social media really highlights this deep voyeurism people have. Mm -hmm. They like snooping in people's lives. Like, yes. wh well, whatever they <laughs> present as their lives in a weird way. Absolutely. Because uh, a trend amongst teenagers and anyone listening know this is the truth, bro. You see what teenagers do? They have a social media page. Mm -hmm. They'll be on social media six, eight hours a day. Yep. But they themselves don't have any posts. Come on. That's a fact. <laughs> so, that's a good point. So like, what's going on here, bro? That's a good point. Yes, you have people who are addicted to studying other people, addicted to watching other people. Oh, I wonder what so-and-so did today. You have some people who get on social media, have made one post within a year, but they only get on social media to look at other people. It's really a sick thing, too, because, you, you know, some people are inspired by others. Okay, you have some who look at it because... Oh, man, she has the body I want. He has the body I want. She got the money I want. He got the car I want. Okay, you have that percentage. Then you have others who are like, man, I look up to this person's education. They have the knowledge I need. They have the knowledge I want. Okay. Then you have another percentage or another area. Okay, this group of people, I want to be a part of what they got going. Okay, cool. But the large percentage. Oh, yeah, our, that's like 5%. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> the, the large percentage in, in our generation and this generation, bro, it is what they doing so that I can get involved in the gossip. And that gossip God is big. I, that one. I like that one. Gossip God. Gossip. I have to steal that one. Too, uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Free game. All right. You can have that one. Gossip, <laughs> gossip God, bro. It's a big deal. People worship gossip like they do Jesus. They have to have it. Well, tell me what happened. What happened? Come on now. I've been waiting for you to call me. Come on now. I saw. Come on, girl. Tell me. Man, bro, tell me what's going on. You need it. Like it's, it's an addiction now. And if you don't see it on social media, you're like, no, it didn't happen. It didn't happen because it wasn't on social media. Wait, 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 I'm sorry. But successful people don't post on social media. Your grandmama didn't have social media. That's why our marriage lasted so long. Let me talk to y'all. Your grandfather did not have no social media. That's why their relationship lasted so long. People worked hard before they got on this thing. And now you think if it's not on there, it don't exist. If it's not on there, it didn't happen. If it's not on there, well, I guess they're not, you know, they're not successful. The most, the bro, come on up. See the last part, the, bro. If, if you're not on social if media, you're not on social media, you're not successful. You're not bro. successful. The richest people on planet Earth, for the vast majority, you don't even know their name. They're not on social media. Elon Musk is not the richest man on the planet. He's the richest one that you know that they've made public. But you have people that are so rich, they don't want to be known. That is how the powers that be operate in the shadows. I don't want no social media. Matter of fact, you have people who work for these social media companies who say, I don't have social media. None of my children do. Who was it? Uh, I believe uh, Mark Zuckerberg over Facebook. He said, no, I don't have Facebook. He said, I don't encourage none of my family to have Facebook. No, because they know. Here's the difference. We don't seek attention, but we know the customer does. So we'll give the customer what they want. People are out here being dope fiends. For this thing. Um, what do you, <laughs> I always say uh, attention is the new currency. Yes. What do you think about that? I think people value attention more than money. Absolutely. No, no. People value attention more than money. Uh, attention, I'll take it a step further just to be more blatant so people can get it through their head. Attention is for whores. And everybody who seeks attention on social media 
is a hoe as of now. They are prostitutes for posts, right? Um, they are loose lasses and loose lads, male, females, for likes. They want it so bad. They'll do anything to get it. Hey, post me up, post me up. They'll get, get all the way naked, just have a string on to get as many likes as possible. Man, hey, bro, let me hold your money real quick. Can I hold your money stack? Can I hold your money stack? <laughs> I've seen it. Can I put on that fake jewelry made out of moissanite, not diamond, your costume jewelry? Bro, let me just borrow that five minutes, take a pic real quick. Can I borrow your car? Can I stand in front of it? Matter of fact, I'm going to go to a rental place and I'm going to stand in front of a car, take a picture just to get it. It's a, it's a very sick thing. Attention used to be currency to a degree, but now it's a mixture of that and it's a mixture of anything that makes me feel good. I have to have that. Matter of fact, I can be broke. But as long as I got a million likes, I don't, I don't need a million know. dollars. I think that's the vibe right now. Well, I know that's the vibe for many people, you know? Yeah. You got people with a million likes, bro. $5 in their bank account. I'm aware that pornography is protected by the First Amendment, right? Mm -hmm. But I have an idea. I know people don't hear it. But I think porn should only be available for pay-per-view. And you need to provide an age verification to purchase it. I'm going to tell you why. Mm -hmm. 39, right? Mm -hmm. So if we were to watch porn, bro... It's a VHS or DVD. It's a whole production. <laughs> That's right. So that alone cuts down the amount of porn you're going to consume. Mm -hmm. But with this generation, bro, it's just a free for all. And it's like it's just destroying them. And it's coming up in different aspects. Like this generation is having the least amount of sex, I guess, mm -hmm. within like the last whatever documented generations. Mm -hmm. They can't interact with each other. Right. Little kids with erectile dysfunction or young yeah. men with erectile dysfunction. Yeah. They don't know how to court a young lady. Yes. And all these things stem from the social anxiety and all the other stuff is like, bro, they just watch porn all day. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's available, I would say maybe I'd be in the same state if I was their age in this environment because mm -hmm. it's just always available. And the fact that they can't handle it, something needs to be done, bro. Absolutely. You know what? I was actually looking at this, too, because it's this overstimulation, overstimulation. That's the term I've left. Yeah. Out, overstimulation. Overstimulation, yeah. hyper sexualization. Um, of this, this dopamine serotonin mixture of the chemistry in the brain. When you see something that you like, you see something that makes you feel good. And you keep seeing, you keep seeing it. So you keep getting stimulated. The problem is this generation is on a horrible diet, not only physically, but also mentally and spiritually. They're eating the most horrible foods that are destroying them physically. They're taking in the most horrible foods that destroy them mentally. And then they don't really have any food spiritually because they're not connected with anybody on a spiritual level for the most part. Right. Um, and in certain areas, it is being worked on, thankfully, but it is also being worked on on the other end because Satan is doing his job. I've been looking at the fact that they are using honey sticks and honey pot or whatever they got dealing with that. You got these 20 year olds on Viagra, Cialis. You have these 20 year olds. And now they're using the social media influencers in our generation to push blue chew and these other things. And I'm very I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. OK, our elders didn't start using that stuff. Until they were in their late 40s, 50s. That was traditional. Hell, even 60s. Y'all are using it in your 20s. Erectile dysfunction is extremely high now because the testosterone level has dropped below 50% of that which we had 30 years ago. Because there is a heightened amount of estrogen chemicals in the food and water supply. Over 70% of many of the foods that we consume today have a heightened amount of estrogen, synthetic estrogen from the soy in the bread, the soy in the cookies, the soy in the pies and cakes, the soy in the ice cream, uh, the atrazine in the water. You have someone by the name of Tyrone B. Hayes, biochemist who has been studying amphibians and particularly frogs for over 20 years at the University of Berkeley. And he found that atrazine, a chemical that was produced by Syngenta, is heavily in the water supply and is also being sprayed on the crops, particularly in California and all across the country. What does atrazine do? It causes femininity in a male. So it leans males into an induced area of heightened femininity, chemically induced. And he was targeted, almost got killed by the pharmaceutical gangsters for exposing this. And why is that important? Because a lot of the foods we eat contain that. The water supply contains that. So what, what, what is going on? We are being conditioned to be feminized as males, masculinized as women. Estrogen is higher in men. Testosterone is lower. Sex drive is lower. So you have to um, you have to substitute that with something that stimulates you for a small period of time to get your erection up. But as you overstimulate that, you cannot do it naturally. 
less and less and less, it becomes a norm. So you have all of that. Then you have the women being overstimulated, over sexualized. So then they can't get to where they want to get because now their bodies are not operating naturally. All of this is by design. So the reason why I brought all of that up is because the porn industry heavily drives it and they make it free because they want us to destroy ourselves in a way where we, where we will accept it through our lower desires and our pleasures. Because if you let a person freely go and have access to pornography, okay, well then hell, I can get that quick shot in the dome, quick shot in the arm, I'm feeling good. But what happens? I'm overstimulating this and this. So by the time I get to a real life interaction, I don't even know how to do anything about that. And that's if, you know, it goes sexual. Courting is out the door. Most of y'all, when you hear courting, you think going to the courthouse. Like they don't even know what courting is. It's a process to determine whether or not you are fit for marriage. That's when you go and ask the father, may I have permission to converse with your daughter? I think she may be fit to be my wife and vice versa with the mother. And you look at the interest to see, do your lifestyles fit? Does your mission fit? You know, how many children would you like to have? Do you, would you like to have children? All of this is a courtship. But you talk about that, they're like, what? It sounds crazy. But that's how our people behave. That's a cultural norm. Courting, not dating, but courting. Because now, but that's a pregnant topic with that relationship thing. Because, you know, nowadays, relationship topics, everybody's an <laughs> expert, right? There's another thing with this porn thing we need to touch on in regards to just your ambition as a person. Hmm. Because it's a toxic uh mocktail they're dealing with mm -hmm. you got the porn the smoking in the pills yes the poverty the depression mm -hmm. fire all those things consistently yes people not doing anything with themselves yeah. it's a fact and the video games too absolutely right so absolutely. it's just like their day is totally consumed with porn video games smoking and social media mm -hmm. like what can you <laughs> i'm just saying that's yeah. like the average dude's day so like mm -hmm. what can he do what can you Good do question. consistently in your life where your time is constantly consumed with these things mm -hmm. that's draining your energy and burning out your mind? Very good question. Two things. You know how the government infiltrated our organizations that were influencing the youth? We have to infiltrate all of the ways that the youth are being influenced. We have to infiltrate video games. We have to infiltrate all of the music in a good way, putting a positive you know, lyrics, the positive images and all that in the music. We have to infiltrate the movies. We have to infiltrate all of the areas that influence them. The one thing that we should not infiltrate is the porn industry. Get up out of that. All right, so that, that we could just knock that off. But everything else we have to infiltrate so that we can get in front of their eyes. That's on one end. Then on the other end, take them away piece by piece from those things. Give them the balance of putting them back in reality. Let's get back together. Let's not only just play sports. Let's do community building, gardening. Let's do some wood shop. Let's get back to laying bricks, brick masonry. Let's get back to doing some electrical work and some welding and some painting. Get back out here doing manhood training. Let's go out to the forest. Do you know how to survive? Matter of fact, what are what are your the directions? What are the four directions? Do you even know? Do you know how to do anything dealing with survival or do you always lead by GPS? You see what I'm saying? All that. And then the same thing with the sisters. They need to know about actual womanhood. So we have to teach about the divine femininity, the divine masculinity. How does that even work? How do you relate to one another? Where does God come in, the supreme being, the most high? Except all of this has to be reestablished. You can play your video games, but take an hour or two out of that. Get back to reading books. The part I'll bring up with that is that people are making stuff, bro. Mm -hmm. But fire, what I realize is that the consumer is so trained to have a taste for a particular thing, they disregard when you present something different. True. So I guess like coach, I don't know how long it would take, but realistically, we had to like change the palette of the consumer because mm -hmm. people make movies mm -hmm. or let's do journalism. For instance, if I, it's a lot of sacrifice for me to do this because I stay in my lane mm -hmm. and I do the best I can. But if I wanted to make more money, of course, there are other things I could do and have different of conversations. Of course. But most people, it's like they don't want to make that sacrifice because you put out great information, you put out great movies, you put out great whatever, but are people supporting them? Mm. Mm -hmm. And do they That's even important. have a taste for that type of material or content, as they would say, you know? I'll say what I've noticed now in my conversation with some of the artists, for example, big artists, celebrities, you name it. They have now grown tired because everything is oversaturated. All the negatives have flooded the market. It's not even trendy no more. The twerking is old now. Where your brain at? Okay, money. It's old now, bro. We learned about fiat currency. We know about the Federal Reserve. 
we on gold now. We, we want to look at gold. Now we want to look at other ways of actual currency. Now we want to look at ways to actually build. Now we're looking at real estate. Now we're looking at owning land. See, people are now looking at this. This generation is really getting tired because a lot of them were raised on social media. And now they're like, okay, all right, I done seen pretty much everything that you could see on this thing. And I'm getting tired. And the artists who heavily inspire this are getting tired. Why? Because many of them have children who they are now seeing have become victims of the actions that they have been involved in and they don't like what they see in. So a lot of them are switching things around. A lot of them, they stopped twerking. A lot of them ain't doing that kind of stuff. They're now trying to do more positive things. That's what it took was the next generation being impacted and a lot of these artists and celebrities and people who were heavily influential and still are being personally affected by it. Now they're like, I don't even want to do this like this no more. I want to change some things up. I want to be a positive role model. That's what it takes. That's what it takes. So you have them on one hand, then the community on the other hand, who are the activists and who are the ones influencing from the ground up. We have to kick into gear more of the unity factor and come together and support one another because we have pretty much everything we need. But we have to we have to have the ego take a back seat and bring unity to the front and say, look, I may not be the brother who has the real estate, but my brother and sister do. I may not be the brother who has, you know, um, this dealing with the banking, but my brothers and sisters, they've been very successful at that. They've been doing that for quite a while. Did y'all even know about them? No, you didn't. Okay, well, now you do. We need to get involved with them. Let's come together and push this stuff more and support one another because we really do have everything we need. But the unity is the only thing that we have lacked is getting better, but we have to push the gas even harder on it. And I believe once we do that all around, our people are going to evolve even more than what they are uh, doing now. Why are prescribed psychiatric drugs like uh, Dexedrine and Ritalin labeled as Schedule II narcotics for those unaware? Um, example of Schedule II narcotics are morphine, cocaine, oxys, methadone, fentanyl are all categorized as Schedule II narcotics. What's that about? If people really want to look at a major causative factor as it pertains to our negative condition being perpetuated in this country, particularly, you have to look at the area of psychiatry, mental health and the prescription drugs. You're talking about over half of the population are on one or more forms of these drugs. Over 150 million people in America are on at least one form of psychotropic drug, which is a legal version, as you said, of cocaine. Of, of all these other different things, methamphetamine, etc. I'll give you an example. Um, not only Thorazine, not only Paxil, not only Zimbalta, not only, you know, um, Rixalti, which scientific name is Brix Paprazol. Tyrese, for example, when he was on Rixalti, that's when he had all of his fits. That's when he was crying hysterically and he was going Breakdowns. to social media. Oh yeah, yeah. Rixalti, he, he had all that. And he said he had to call his therapist and get off of that because it was making him uncontrollably emotional. He noticed it. Here's the crazy part. All of those drugs, all of these Schedule II narcotics, all of those that are legal have every type of effect you can imagine. And then a whole list of ones that you can't imagine. They've, had, they've estimated that over 50% of all people that commit mass shootings right now in America are on at least one or two psychotropic drugs. Oh, yeah. At, at least at least one or two of those. They have even admitted that, yes, we have cured zero people. Zero cures. But you have all these people on these drugs. You're making over three thousand dollars every minute of every day. And you are helping zero people while telling people they have a mental disease that you have yet to prove. This is how you have the biggest gangsters in the world, the biggest drug dealers in the world. Can't nobody on no corner in no hood push what psychiatric drugs have pushed, what pharmaceuticals have pushed, what that whole industry of so-called mental health has pushed. The drugs are what drive it. If there were no drugs, they'd have to actually focus on helping the people directly and addressing your mental issues, not from a chemical perspective, but from an actual emotional perspective, a traumatic perspective, a, ha a family historical perspective. From a perspective. society perspective. A bro. societal perspective, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the real causes, the real causes, not saying, oh yeah, well, you know, this drug is gonna cure you. How can you give me a physical solution to a mental problem? The mind is not physical. So how the hell is this drug gonna help me? And if it did help me, then that means I would no longer need the drug, which means you would lose money. So do you wanna, 
You, it's a conflict of interest. Are you sure? <laughs> it's, a, it's a game. You're talking about fraud at the highest level, bro. The area of psychiatry in particular, not just the field of mental health, because not all therapists, not all psychologists, no, but in particular the area of psychiatry, and it's not all psychiatrists that know this, but that field is so heavily steeped in the system of eugenics, so heavily steeped in the history of dehumanization of human beings, to where when you finally learn about it, the very nature of it does not allow you to cure nor actually address actual root causes. Because if you do that, there will be no need, no requirement for the drug. And you will only be able to address the human being. Once you address them, they will no longer be a customer anymore. And uh, I have a second part I want to tie in in regards to the uh, criminal system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you just mentioned uh, mass shooters on this. Yes. But I just think people in general in regards to the right I understand people need to be penalized for the action. I am not, I want to be clear. I'm not saying for sure. should do crazy stuff and for not sure. be penalized, but we have to reevaluate their state of mind at the time. Mm -hmm. If you are on, say, some of these prescription drugs or on other narcotics, but even like, I think that that poverty, bro, and that stress puts people in a different mind space and they begin to behave in a manner that's not their highest form, I yeah, would say. It's not their norm. Right? So with that said, do we have to factor that more into the criminal system in regards to people's mind frame? I know people plead insanity some are insane, mm -hmm. some play games, mm -hmm. but some people probably really are insane when they're behaving in that manner. They're not in the proper state of mind. That point is a point that not too many people know how to break down because it can be useful to people who do things intentionally, but then not useful to people who genuinely did not intentionally do anything at all. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, uh, the famous shooting Columbine, uh, Eric Harris was on Luvox. He was having suicidal thoughts, homicidal tendencies. The Batman movie theater shooting, white dude with the orange hair. He was on multiple psychotropic drugs and had been under the care of a psychiatrist for over 10 years. Um, the Las Vegas shooter, he was on multiple psychotropic drugs. You name it, the Virginia Tech shooter way back then, and a lot of them today. But here's the very quick key about all this. If they were black men, could they plead insanity? That's just the point. But if you're on one of these drugs, it is very well known that the common effects are suicidal thoughts, homicidal tendencies, where you're hearing voices telling you to do this. It's actually feeling a good, it's a feeling of a, a good thought to want to die or to kill someone. That's what many of these drugs or most actually induce. They, it's a synthetic form of making you feel good about the idea of killing yourself and others. This is known in these drugs. So when they are perplexed by 22 veterans committing suicide every day, how are you perplexed when you have them on a concoction of these drugs that you give them that causes them to have these thoughts? Suicidal thoughts, homicidal tendencies. How are you perplexed that you're giving people bags, brother, bags of drugs that cause them to have these issues? Children on Ritalin, which is cocaine. You talking about there's something wrong with little Billy. Yeah, he high. And you made him high. So why are you bouncing off the walls doing all this craziness? It's because you gave him a drug when you should have addressed the problem that he had. Maybe it's because he just want a father. Maybe it's because he just needs somebody to guide him. He needs some love. He needs some instruction, some direction, some discipline. No, you gave him a damn drug because you trusted these folks who told you it's safe. And so they didn't know, some of them, most of them do, but the paycheck is too damn good. The industry is too big. And the only way it's going to stop is when somebody on the inside comes out and blows the whistle on it. Same way on every other thing. When it hits them personally, that's when they come out and start exposing it. But it's a very real thing, brother, that that pleading insanity is definitely factual in many of the cases because these people were not in their right mind. So let's make this clear. We have to be, like you said, we have to be very specific. Put it in context. But think, bro, you work with gang members. Yeah. They're not in their right mind. No, a lot of them are not. It's the reality of it. Yeah. It's a mixture of things. <laughs> you mixture know what I'm it's saying? the trauma, it's the weed, the syn it's the synthetic gmo medical cannabis that you think just got natural thc in it but you do you know how okay all right i gotta i gotta mention this here the medical marijuana brother uh today is far from this natural weed that we knew in the 90s and the 80s and all the way before no 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 no. what they got today is spliced with so many chemicals spiked with so many chemicals that many of those chemicals in this medical marijuana are causing the psychotic breaks a lot of these brothers are going crazy just off of that.
And they're like, well, no, nah, he didn't have nothing else. He was an owner. THC too high. Fire is oh, no the balance THC in is there. extremely high. What's it called? Psychosis or something? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's causing mental psychosis, straight mental breaks. These brothers are, they are off. Again, I'm specifying the medical marijuana. If your enemy approves something, you should not partake in it. Don't touch it. What, what I found weird was I stopped smoking in 2016, but I smoked a lot of weed in my life, right? Mm-hmm. And I thought it was weird when people got aggressive smoking weed. Right? I thought that was like a liquor thing. Come on, brother. Well, you burn the herbs. The last thing I want is confrontation. You like the coke or some the, PCP? That's the last thing on my mind. And like, do say so they say they just burn the herb and they got a, a whole vibe to them. So yes. obviously they either mixing it with something, mm-hmm. and some say they are not. So it must be something in the weed, bro. Brother, people don't want to. They don't want to look at the truth of that because we got a lot of our people that smoke. And they just want to smoke. And it's like, brother, all right, you know what? Here's my challenge to everybody who smokes weed. Take it to a lab. Take it to a lab. You know that, that dime bag, whatever you got, that half that your homeboy got from your supplier? Take it to a laboratory. Actually take it to an unbiased lab somewhere far away. Have them research this. Break it down. Go back in a week or so. Get the full analysis of every chemical that is in what you got that they said they grew. And there's nothing else in it. You will be shocked to find all the chemicals that are in it. And don't lie to yourself. Be honest when you see it. The majority of smokers ain't never been to a damn lab. They never handed nobody nothing to put in a lab. But they say, man, this is this natural, blah, blah, blah. And some of y'all gonna get mad right now in the comments. I don't give a damn. I gotta help you. Google EA2233. Google red oil. Look at how the military was experimented on using marijuana. Look at how George Soros invested in it. Look at Prop 64 in California. Look at how Tommy Hilfiger invested in it. Look at how Bill Gates invested in it. You need to know what you're dealing with here. Seriously. If you want to be honest about it, cool. If you want to smoke, that's your deal. But smoke responsibly. (laughs) And that includes being responsible with what you know. Because once you find out what I'm telling you, then you'll be like, damn, you know what? Now you got to make a decision. Some of us got to confront life, man. I'm from Compton. We got family in it. But most of my family, they don't smoke no more because they figured it out. So it's all it's out of love, but you gotta you gotta know the truth, brother. Once this enemy approved marijuana and Monsanto got their hands in it, I knew for a fact, and I told people this: pharmaceutical companies are going to switch their investments, specifically tobacco companies, are going to switch their investments into marijuana after it gets legalized. As a matter of fact, they helped to legalize it by funding it because they were getting too many lawsuits with the tobacco industries. They got too many. I'm talking about tens of thousands of lawsuits. They were losing money left. And right, and they say we need to switch our investment into something that people are going to accept, that people are going to push faster, smoke faster, have the least amount of resistance to. And what was their magic cash cow? Marijuana. Boom. To this day, you have cats talking about, I have never felt the way I feel now smoking what I'm smoking versus years ago. It's just something to look into. So don't get mad at me, y'all. Just go and research what I'm talking about, and you'll see that your brother's right and exact. Again, go find a lab, and you'll see. Many studies that they have come out with now, and a lot of people in the cannabis industry have figured this out because, you know, they're trying to be more responsible for their clientele and their customers than the pharmaceutical industry. So they're looking at it in their system of hydroponics. They're studying it. And they're like, wait a minute. What is this doing to the testicles of men and the ovaries of women? There are many studies that have come out demonstrating what it is doing in a negative. It is reducing the motility of sperm cells, meaning it's reducing the energy of sperm to swim against the current within the womb of a woman. To oh, he said, he said the sperm weak. Your brother, I'm t- hey, it's weakening the sperm. <laughs> you think your stroke game is good and your sperm is like, ah, ah. I'm telling you, it's a very serious thing. It's, it's, it's really, we are dealing with scientists of evil, bro, and we have to admit that. We have to admit that we are still dealing with the same enemy. We really are. The enemy's not going to say, oh, yeah, you want to smoke weed? I'm going to legalize it. I'm not going to let your uncle out. I'm not going to let your grandmama out. I'm not going to let nobody out, really, um, who we locked up for having it. But we're going to let our wife, our counterparts invest in it. Some of y'all can invest in it. Matter of fact, it's a booming industry. Get involved. Sure. Hemp oil, hemp seeds, all that kind of stuff. Great. Cool. But um, we're not going to tell you everything that's really in this. And that's what I want people to look at is just look at exactly what's in it. Separate everything. Look at the CBD versus the actual just plant by itself. Look at the seeds versus the plant. You know, look at every component of it because all of this is different. So we have to have a thorough knowledge of it. But again, your enemy did not approve of it. 
for good intentions. I never heard that because I know about women dying during birth. I know about abortions. I Brother. didn't know about the weak sperm. Brother, I I have to I have to know. This my duty is to know these things that's to true. let our people know. Now again, if you don't take it, that's cool. But I'm not just going to spew some stuff out here. I'm from Compton. I grew up in my whole family. I finished smoking weed at nine years old. That's how late y'all are. I done did that. <laughs> I'm done with. It. I'm good. Got high a couple times. Good. Finished drinking alcohol at nine. Like really, I was done with this preteen, bro. I was done with it. I was like, all right, cool. It ain't for me. Some people they're like, well, it's for me. All right, if it's for you, learn about it. Like really, and don't run away from the the ugly facts about it. Really learn about it and be honest with yourself. That's all. Really, we currently live in a real life sci-fi movie with some mm -hmm. very disturbing technology, right? Um, can you talk about nanobots, edible humans, the palm readers in stores? and this Neuralink recognition. Mm -hmm. um, I just want you to break down like, what's the manufacturer's reason for creating this product and the possible dangers of the product starting with nanobots? Let me give you what they're saying. You know, the, the, the good old commercialized, very innocent reason that they're saying we've created nanobots and nanoparticle technology. One, it's to help humanity to uh, kill cancer cells is one major reason. To find out different things happening in the body before they become an actual problem, to point out you know, tumor forming cells, et cetera, things that are possibly happening in the body before we become notified on the outside. Those nanobots can go in, detect it, find it, locate it, kill it, boom, will help us to prevent any potential issues. Okay, that sounds nice. Another thing, uh, it's to help with the stimulation of the nervous system, to help to rebuild cells, damage cells, cells within the eyes, the retinas, specifically for a lot of blind people they have. They're looking at studies dealing with that for paraplegic and quadriplegic people, the disconnections or the damaged uh, nerve endings in specific parts of the nervous system, looking at how we can use nanobots to repair the nervous system. Okay, sounds innocent. Same thing with brain cells. Potential people who are leaning into Alzheimer's and they're having early onset dementia, we're going to use these nanobots to go in and potentially repair the cells to help them to live longer, to have a well-standing memory. Okay, so, so all that sounds nice. Okay, here's the other side that they're not telling people. For example, Neuralink, that specifically is talking about placing chips in the brain. Company that's- Bro, That was wild when I heard. Oh yeah. I heard that one, that was pretty wild, man. Oh yeah. Continue, yeah, Elon Musk and his company that has primarily experimented using monkeys with these chips in the brain. He's saying that Neuralink is being developed for specifically paraplegic people, quadriplegic people, people who can't walk, can't use their arms or legs. Okay. Alzheimer's also, I think. Uh, uh, Alzheimer's, yes. Yeah. Alzheimer's also. And they're adding a list of things that can potentially be helped uh, with this brain chip. Okay. Some people have seen the movie Total Recall. Some people have seen the movie Minority Report. Some people have seen different movies where they always have this fascination with the brain. You know, memories, personalities, injecting personalities, taking them out, etc. Okay. The Neuralink capability is going to allow you, according to what they're saying, to enter the different computer, you know, uh, mainframes, enter social media, interface and connect with technology without having to physically touch it. Text people by thought, make calls by thought, all this, make posts by thought. Okay, sounds, sounds dope for some people. Oh man, oh, this is dope, it's the future. Okay, what's stopping them or preventing them from invading your brain, taking information out? They're gonna be downloading all the data Come on, that's really? in your brain, so Bro. That's, that's what I, Continue, Please, sorry. I mean, come on. If you are interested in me saying I want to help life easier for you, I want to make life so much easier. I want you to be able to make a post without touching your phone. Okay, you're not, see, we're not being real intelligent here. A group of people or a government that has that type of technology can use it for drones. They can use it for weapons. See, they, the government is always using, they're looking at the military side of things, the military aspect. How can we use this to increase our power dynamic? That's how they're going to use it. It ain't about making a person walk because you would prevent all the things that make it to where a person can't walk. You would stop selling them pharmaceutical drugs that have side effects that damage the nervous system. You would stop legalizing a lot of the other drugs that damage the brain, damage the spine, etc. You would start there, right, if you really cared. But you're saying, well, you know what, let's go ahead and create this, do these different things. It's not entirely kosher. It's not entirely innocent like they make it out to be. It has everything to do more so with control than you have certain people who work for these companies who genuinely want to help humanity evolve and advance. You do. You have some good people 
who want to do good things, some, but I don't believe that those at the top have that innocent idea about it. I doubt that. But I do believe there are some good people involved in technology, involved in these areas of robots and all that, who want to help humanity, who want to say, you know what, if I can put on this suit, this robotic suit that helps me to lift 500 pound things or jump over buildings, you got people who are really involved in that. But the other end, like the movie I, Robot, one of the greatest documentaries ever told, uh, is when Will Smith said, oh, that's just stupid. You, you handed the world over to a bunch of artificially intelligent, robotic, humanoid individuals. And you're saying that's smart? You have a, a uh, robot called Asimo, I believe. It's one of the robots that Elon Musk has developed. Autonomous, robotic, human being. Walk, talk. They've been, they've been advancing it. They've been working on it, working on it. The goal is for him to be able to supply one to every home for under 30 grand. Same way iRobot did. They are quickly advancing this thing. And they're very serious. And by 2030, roughly 2030, maybe 2035, the majority of warehouse jobs, security jobs, any type of jobs like that will be wiped out. Why? Because why would you continue to pay a human being, have liability insurance to cover them, and all these potential issues, potentials of being sued and all that? Why would you worry about that when you could just pay for one robot and just pay for general maintenance and not have to worry about it? To handle those jobs you know it's wild bro it's watching sad a, it's uh, real i was i was watching a throwback of family member family matters and i had mm -hmm. to check the year it was a 1992 episode or 93 when urkel had uh and the, he used the word artificial intelligence yes bro. i thought that was pretty wild steve urkel man yeah. jaleel white knew it he was on point he really played that role very well and they put a lot of highly intellectual maneuvers in there not only with the time machine but with his vehicle his car like he was very I was like, yeah, they, they were dropping some heavy jewels in that movie. And the, robot, that, that the robot was very manipulative and very uh, evil in a sense. Like, very yes. strategic, you know? I remember that, For yes. For a, 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 a kid's a family <laughs> TV show, you know? So yes. Explain to the viewers uh, the difference between Ethiopian Christianity and European Christianity. Oh, yeah. yeah. From what I know, just on a basic level, the Ethiopian Christianity is far more family-centered, far more actual God-centered, older deeply traditional as it pertains to how they venerate God. It's not from a Caucasian European, we worship this white man. That's not, <laughs> that's not how it was. As a matter of fact, even in the, I believe, Ethiopian Christian uh, religion, the swastika, believe it or not, is a part of one of the ancient Ethiopian symbols um, as a symbol of peace, which is very interesting to me when I learned that. Um, so for just from what I know, it differs in so many ways. That Christianity that is European, which was developed in 325 AD, you're talking about over with Constantine and all of that, uh, where they were manipulating the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity, this white man, these individuals, and they manipulated all of that and they took that from the ancient Egyptian belief. You're talking about with Horus, you're talking about with Isis, you're talking about with all of the myths and mythological or mythology over there in Egypt, which was also taken as well. You go over to Hare Krishna in India. You're talking about all of this when it comes to who the Christ is, the Christ son. You're talking about all of that. That stuff was manipulated to the Europeans' benefit. They basically put a whole lot of pieces together to create this whole story to then push their belief. While in Ethiopia, it's something they were practicing long before that. Black Jesus or a black son, black God, everything was black centered. That's pretty much from the basic of what I know, and I'm still doing more studying about that because I, I want to know more on the deep cultural aspects because that's another thing. They made sure to keep the cultural side safe and not just look at the deity or deification of things. They looked at the culture. On this end in the Caucasian Christianity, it's everything is based around this specific figure. And you worship that figure, which in turn you'll worship the people that look like that figure. But over here, it's more of an African-centered culture that they also have the spiritual side in. And uh, obviously, you've been around uh, Farrakhan, right? Absolutely. Uh, why does the minister reference the Bible so much in his teachings? Oh, yeah. I actually saw him address this one time. He was addressed it many times. But they said, yeah, why, you know, Minister Farrakhan, we notice you bring up the Bible. You're a Muslim. You know, we do notice you bring up the Holy Quran as well. And he said, well, my people are buried in the Bible. So one, from a historical knowledge of knowing the original people, 
that are in the Bible as it pertains to the historical side of things and how they manipulated that. Because we're taught that the Bible is known as the poison book, meaning if you do not know how to differentiate from the facts and the metaphors, the facts and how they put in certain imagery and certain things to manipulate the minds of the people, you will get tricked by the lies that are in it rather than knowing what the facts are. So a lot of people are tricked and that's why we call it the poison book and we can't necessarily refer to it as holy, specifically the King James Version in 1611 and all these other different variations. But he has to bring up the Bible. He also said that I utilize the Bible because that is what our people have been broken into. That is what our people for generations have been so heavily used to. So if I can use what they know to help them to see the truth and to pull it out of them into the overall truth, then that is what a wise leader does. Easier to fish people. Absolutely. Well, not, not just that, but if that's your language, that's the only language you know. He said, I can't bring a Christian the Holy Quran because they don't know that language. So I'm going to bring you the biblical language, but I'm going to teach you the truth about it. But first, I'm going to bring it out of those scriptures. You know it as this scripture or that scripture. OK, well, then that's what the scripture I'm going to use. And then I'm going to show you how that reflects in history, in the Holy Quran, in science, in this, in that. So that way, you know how to connect it rather than just looking at it as a past thing. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad said roughly 75 percent of the Bible is prophetic and 25 is historical. Muhammad Elijah Muhammad said that. And so you can look at that and verify that when you look at the scriptures of the Bible, simply put them over America and see if they fit. Put them over this land and see if they fit. Most, pretty much everything in Revelations, you put that over the planet right now. <sighs> pretty much, you see, so you can demonstrate to see, is it really prophetic? Was it talking about a future circumstance or was it talking about a past? Everything from Jesus all the way down to nation rising against nation, etc. From Genesis to Revelations, you will see that the majority of that fits now in present time all over the world. So that's why yeah, I utilize the Bible. The question I have about the revelation, right? Tell me what you think about this. Is it that the people have, there's two ways to look at it. The people have prophetic ability or they had a deep understanding of man and saw where man was going. I think it's both. Both. I think it's both for sure because our people are far more connected to their spirituality. You know, uh, the original people far more connected. There was no social media to distract you. There was not this widespread drugs that there weren't these things that heavily broke us down into more of a man or lesser than a man. We were closer to the God connection. We were closer to our spirituality. We felt more. We operated along nature. We knew what things were. So for us to tap into thought, even in the Bible, it does say that Jesus had the ability to tune into the thoughts of people, the thoughts of man. That's what we were able to do. So for us to have prophecy or prophetic speakings, we knew history so we could connect. And we're also taught that, you know, the wise man writes his history roughly 25,000 years in advance. So we studied it based upon what we knew back then and that we could prophesy mathematically what was to come. So we were far more connected back then. We need to get back to that. That's the goal is to get back to how we were originally and then even evolve beyond that. All right. Last thing with Farrakhan. Explain what he means by the mothership. I always talk about, mm -hmm. I heard him talk, but I never like clearly heard the breakdown. Could you break it down for me? Absolutely. The, the uh, best people that break down that would be Elia Rashad Muhammad, number one, uh, brother Demetric Muhammad, number two, brother Dr. Wesley Muhammad, number three, and of course the Honorable Minister Farrakhan himself. They have spoken on the wheel extensively. So people know it as UFOs, what America has recently admitted to just a year ago that yes, they exist, fine. <laughs> they was basically like, look, okay, we can't hide it no more. Yes, they exist. Yes, we've known about this for over 50 years, over 60 years. I need everyone to look at something called the Battle of LA that took place in Los Angeles over 50 years ago, where the military went onto the coast, roughly Playa del Rey toward the end of the 105 freeway at that time, and they were shooting at a flying wheel like object in the sky they were shooting bullets they was like this is really happening fire this is a movie or this is real no life? this is real life this is long before independence day brother I look this if up. you people don't know what independence day was based off of yeah. the battle of la you google, you google that and you will see old newspaper clippings of what took place and they were like wait a minute this actually happened the news reported on it it flew from that area all the way through past compton and different parts down past Signal Hill in Long Beach, and it disappeared off the coast of Long Beach. That happened. And this is something that has happened all over the planet. Multiple nations have revealed their documentation on what they refer to as UFOs. But the Honorable Ms. Farrakhan, as we're taught by the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, 
He knows exactly what that is. It's not some alien craft. It was built by human beings, by the original people. You talking about, I mean, like really, because now it's like, put it this way, everything from the pyramids all the way down, they give it to the aliens. They want to take everything away from black folks having anything to do with anything that is technologically advanced. So right now, some people may look at me, but just go and research everything I just told you, and you will see that there is far more connecting those dots historically in the Bible, in the book of Ezekiel, I believe Ezekiel third chapter 17 verse, where he talks about a wheel inside of a wheel coming in the clouds of fire or clouds in the sky. The Bible talks about the wheel. I mean, this is all over the world in multiple religions. They talk about that. But the United States government never wanted to admit to it because they do not want to admit that there is a power that they can't control. That is something that they cannot deal with. They don't have anything to stop it. They don't have anything to combat it. They, Like I said, in the Battle of L.A., and many times after that, they have tried to literally shoot at these things. They have clocked them at upwards of 3,000 miles per hour when they were chasing them. They have footage of chasing them, and they have footage of them moving forward, backward, going up and down, in maneuvering in ways that they have no aircraft that can catch it. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad, when he was arrested uh, the first time, and I believe no, first or second time, when they went and took the drawings of the wheel, because we were taught that he was taught by God of what these things were, half a mile by half a mile. Maybe planes inside of a mother wheel, a human built city in the sky that is an actual wheel-like ship object. Now, again, some people can believe all kind of crazy stuff. You believe Jesus is a man coming in the clouds one day. A lot of people think this, right? He's gonna come someday. Okay, fine. Then this should be too far-fetched because it's even more realistic that it's possible that something can be built and controlled you know, so I think people, it will be best that you you study Eli Rashad Muhammad, Dimitri Muhammad, uh, Minister Farrakhan, of course, and Wesley Muhammad. They have all broken this down from historical, Quranic, biblical, all the way down so that you can get a full understanding of it. Has the minister ever spoke about the uh, Anunnaki? You know what? I haven't heard him. He has, but I've never heard him use the word Anunnaki. He's talked about, um, you know, like our people, the original people, yeah, yeah. giants, the ancient, were much taller and... He's talked about that a lot of, I think, uh, Dr. Ava Muhammad, I think, and, and uh, Mother Tynetta Muhammad, they've talked about that. Can you break down the importance of melanin and carbon, please? Absolutely. In regards to black people. Absolutely. Melanin, carbon. Very critical that uh, this is why you have to really be thankful and be appreciative if you are a black man or woman or any melanated being on the planet because it means biochemically you have a deeper connection to the universe to nature, to the supreme being itself. We literally are the people of the stars, you could say, when it comes to how we are constructed. So that's why we have to continue to take you know, minerals and eat things that are from the earth because we are a part of it physically. Carbon-12 in particularly, when people break it down, uh, you look at six protons, six neutrons, six electrons. That's where the original 666, right? Not the mark of the beast, 666, but when we're talking about biochemistry, we're looking at not just the pigmentation, but our ability to connect to nature, the grounding, the sun, how we absorb nutrients at a higher rate, how our bones and tendons and ligaments, all of this in our tissue is constructed. It is deeper. It is more connected, I would say, more than the Caucasian, for example. We can go outside in the sun and be cool. You know, we can still get sunburned too, though. Don't get it twisted. Some black folks are like, I can't get burned. Yes, you can. All right, don't, don't get it twisted. Uh, but we can last far longer because of our melanin. Um, so it, it is a deep gift and it is something that the universe itself has. Um, melanin is found in everything from water to hair to of course in your blood, your skin and all that. It's found in plant life. It's found in all these different things. So it's something that connects the life that reflects within itself. Very simple. That's why we have to eat plants. That's why we have to eat fruits and all of that. So that's just a basic level. Like I don't, without even having to go into full depth of all of it, it's something to be appreciated. And I think people should study our brother, Dr. Layla Africa, you know, who has broken that down. May Allah be pleased with our brother, one of our, our ancestors now, who did beautiful, extensive work on that, uh, including our brother, Dr. Kaba Kamene as well, who has done extensive work on that. But it's a serious thing to be thankful for because those who do not have it are trying to buy it. I don't know if people know this, but melanin is something that's being sold in creams and these different applications. People are getting melanin injections right now to help to sustain their livelihood. People are doing this to this very day. So, again, um, 
you know, that leans into other things as well. Dealing with the organ trafficking and all that. There are a lot of people who know the benefit and the value of melanin. And they are doing all that they can to get as much as they can to sustain their livelihood. Meanwhile, we have it in abundance. All right. I want to touch on another thing I heard you say. Um, paraphrasing, right? Mm -hmm. Heard you want to say dog is not man's best friend. God is man's best friend, right? Yes, sir. What do you believe is the source of Americans? current unhealthy relationship with dogs mm, that is a very good question i think you are the first person to ask me that question well i'll start by saying this when i said dog is not man's best friend god is man's best friend i was quoting minister farrakhan when he mentioned that and he was talking about a chapter in the holy quran that talks about the people of the cave and it was talking about who was the best friend of the people that lived in the cave referring to the Caucasus mountains Okay, you're talking about in Asia, the Caucasus Mountains. When the European was in that mountain, they ate things that were raw, crawling on the walls. They defecated wherever. They did not know how to season food because the seasonings grow outside, you know, in the sun. Uh, they did not know how to bury their dead. They did not know how to take care of their sick. And the friend that they had that hung around them was the dog. Now, this is historical facts, not racism. It's just historical fact. That is something that if you want to look at an epigenetic type of deal from a memory standpoint, never left them. So, <laughs> so they have transferred that into their cultural norm all the way up to this very point. So dogs is, is a particular group of people's best friend. That's why they call it man's best friend. And for those unaware, dogs, are, it's not a universal love for dogs. I noticed through globalization now, like I could see when I was a kid going to Jamaica, they didn't treat dogs like it was just whatever. But everybody's now, not kissing dogs in the mouth. Yeah, but now it's some <laughs> little vibe where some people are uh, have this love for dogs do watching TV mm -hmm. and, and that type of vibe. But um, do you think that like also with the dog vibe, it's a thing where they can't connect with a human being? Because I noticed like, and I'm not saying all people, but I've noticed a lot of lonely people are people who can't sustain a relationship have a very good relationship with their dog. Absolutely. So that seems to be this default thing where like, I don't have any friends, but like my dog is my companion almost. Yes. They, they are now calling them emotional support animals and they're getting grants for it. They're getting insurance coverage for it. Um, they're getting prescribed an emotional support animal from their therapist as a way <laughs> to make people feel good, to prevent suicidal thoughts, to the, all this kind of stuff. People are now getting these animals and they're being like, I'm talking about heavily coddled. You need an emotional support animal. You need a dog or a cat. So you have cat lovers and dog lovers. Now, don't get mad at me, y'all. Uh, but the reality is it's not a universal love for dogs. That's one. Number two, it does come from a heavy European Eurocentric caucus culture. It does, especially when you go as far as having intimate relations, the, the deep kissing in the mouth, laying in bed with you. Okay, since y'all was talking about coronavirus, dogs carry coronaviruses. Okay, so you, you, you have all of that going on, and that's something that people have to study to know, is this my culture? Or is it something that I've been indoctrinated into adopting as culture? Because it's not normal. It's not even close to normal. People have been so normalized because they put it in movies, cartoons. They put in all these different things. You know, every commercial, you feel good because you got a dog throwing a frisbee. Hey, everything, it looks like, yeah, no, that's not our culture. Um, but again, if you have a dog, I get it for security purposes or whatever, but just know what culture you're adopting because a lot of cultures eat dogs, Thanks. not just the Chinese. In America, over 15 states, you can legally eat dog meat. Uh, and I believe a few of them, you can sell dog meat. So just make that clear as well. So it's not one size fits all. It's not a universal thing. And the last thing I mentioned is um, a lot of people, because of their lack of an ability to communicate or relate to human beings, they default to animals because it's easier, it's less maintenance. You know, the it, animal domesticated, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Not in their true nature. No, seriously. So it's a controlled thing underneath there too, and some weird vibe, you know. Yes, so. absolutely. It goes all the way back to the kings and queens over in Spain and different parts of Europe, brother. They had their dogs in their bed with them, laying with them until the Moors came in and civilized them and put the dogs and animals in the barns and started putting up barns or crowds and start to separate that stuff and say, look, do not sleep with your animals. Put them up. That's why you're getting so damn sick. They started teaching them. You're getting all of these issues because you have those animals with these worms and parasites and all that. You're kissing them all in the mouth and those parasites are now going into your bloodstream 
Now it's causing you to have all of these different illnesses. You know, just basics. So people have to get this through their head. And again, I see it all the time, but it's a, it's a culture that has now been normalized because you adopted something that is not your own. And last thing I want to touch on, uh, people's uh, treating animals better than human beings. Mm. You know, that's why I said it's unhealthy. That was the main reason I said it's unhealthy. Like you have a big culture where people really have more care for a dog than another human being. There's less trauma with animals than with human beings. A dog ain't never betrayed me. My cat never cheated on me. You know, this dog ain't never left me. He always going to be by my side. All I need to do is feed him. He more loyal than, than my baby father. You know, he more loyal than all three of my baby mamas. It's, I've heard some of the craziest stuff. And it's like, no, it's less responsibility. You don't have to be accountable at all because your animal ain't saying nothing to you. If animals could talk, these humans would feel real bad. You'll kick out most of your animals because they, they see everything and they look at you like, you got your damn... If animals really could talk to you, they would. You wouldn't feel so good. That's why you keep them around because they don't hold you accountable <laughs> for the most part. They make you feel good because they just they they're cool with everything, good and the bad. But the point is, human beings come with more responsibility, and a lot of us want to run from that because we have trauma, we have all these different issues. But my animal is always going to be right here for me. All I need to do is just feed and, and make sure he's all right or she's all right or they're all right, and I'm good. We, we have to get more connected with human beings. Stop attacking, stop trying to control people and confront and communicate, dialogue. You know, we have to get back to being a human being and really find out what is a human being. Because now you got people who are trying to call themselves dogs, talking about I identify as a dog. You know what, they just had a protest. I mean, I'm, just, I'm just, hold on, man. They just had a protest. <laughs> Over 100 people pulled up to a building and were barking for an hour straight in protest saying that we are self-identifying human dogs and we deserve respect. Brother, these people are insane. This is where it's going. It's really talking about wolf. Like you got people really getting surgeries to look like animals. It's how far some people are going here. I've heard you use the term numerous times, black, white supremacist, right? <laughs> uh, what is your definition of a black, white supremacist? A black man on the outside, but who does any and everything that he can to benefit the system of white supremacy on the outside. In and everything. Justifies the evils that have been perpetuated against black people. Justifies the evil and wickedness of the system to do what it does to completely dehumanize us on a daily basis. Uh, justifies all the evil claps for all the, the so-called benefits, you know, and it does anything that he can to keep the system alive. That's really what a black white supremacist is. It was really Dave Chappelle when he came up with that term that I saw, that I first heard, was when he did that with Clayton Bixby. It was by far one of the most genius things you could ever put on national television as a black man who was blind, who thinks he's white, thinks he's in the Klan, a Klan leader, and is talking the, the craziest stuff about black folks and don't even realize he's black. There are a lot of people like that today. That sounds like a lot of people, bro. Yeah, it's a lot of people. <laughs> Y'all know who they are. Yeah, really. And I mean, they 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 sound they sound nice, right? They justify it. You know, their audiences for the most part are not as educated as they think they are. Because if they really were, then they would realize, oh wow, you're just using the same old white supremacist talking points to justify the evil and wickedness that the system perpetuates. It's real I, I just noticed as a culture, those are the people we praise the most. It's sad. It's sad because we don't want to take responsibility for our people. We don't. It's like a, a pile of trash. We don't want to clean it up. We want somebody else to do it. Matter of fact, we're just going to blame the trash for being there. Why the hell is there even trash here? This is the situation we're dealing with. We have to clean up our own situation. We have to clean up our environment. The majority of our people are good people. It's just we have issues going on that we need to confront. But me sitting here trying to align with the system and say, yeah, those people, every one of them are going to get their n-word wake-up call every one of them you can bend over all the way you want to for this system it will never bend over for you you can run around here all these statistics that you skewed and made up and manipulated from a white pole system from another one of them things you keep running around and just keep doing all that barking cool get them little dollars you get from the system little crumbs but you will never be able to come back to your people that's the sad part many of them don't realize this once this system is done with you and they always will be done with you once they're done using you, you will default and try to come back to your people, but you won't be able to. There are some black folks on the outside who have disqualified themselves. 
we cannot trust them and they don't realize that they will you know sad to say but I, I just feel bad for a lot of them because some people feel that they're very convincing but the people who feel that they're convincing don't know about the history all right and there's a flip side to it so we balance out the argument mm -hmm. uh the idea that every black person who's successful is a sellout oh yeah no. right we have yeah. to clear hey that's a very destructive idea by the way too because it's kind of i think it actually deters people from doing stuff yes yes absolutely if you say that every black person that is successful is a sellout then what you're saying is in order for me to not be a sellout i have to be poor i have to be unsuccessful i have to not be clean cut i gotta be a nigga 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 i'm a real nigga but a real unsuccessful nigga that doesn't make Mediocre. sense so martin luther king unsuccessful some people would he worked for the system okay you can take the good work that he did it amounts to more than what the majority of these people did you got hit upside the head with rocks you got shot at dog sicked on you see just that alone i don't even have to look at nothing else our people who were the most successful did so with the highest level of opposition today you think you're successful because you get a million views on a youtube video it's a big difference in how we're thinking here so a sellout um doesn't mean that oh because you're successful you are selling out for the system no a lot of our people can live have survived didn't get shot and are successful um and have nothing to do with this damn system it exists we generalize too much because it hurts to think logically and to separate things we rather just generalize when it's like no 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 take time point out as many people as you know who you know are legit you know they're legit. You see them, they're successful. They still come around the hood. They build up the people. You know, but you know they ain't got nothing to do with the system. Be honest about those because I know we all can point out at least one or two people that we know are successful, doing good work for the people, taking care of their family, but they never sold out and they never will. We have to be honest about it and put that image out there. That way we can see the honesty and the reality, which is we got a lot of our people that are successful. And then in turn, the children will see it. These generations will see it. And then they'll start to pattern themselves after that behavior to be successful without having to sell out. There is an epidemic of abducted children and women in America that is not getting media attention. Mm -hmm. uh, black children which are make up about 33% of all missing child cases in America. And I believe black women make up 40%. I'm not sure if that's the exact number. Mm -hmm. um, and who's to say this number is not higher, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to give context, black people only make up 13% of the country. Right. Um, the question I have is, how many of these victims are sex trafficking victims? Very good question. I'll say this way. We did a protest in Atlanta a few years back. It was uh, Stop Sex Trafficking ATL. We went to the Capitol, I believe, uh, and we were exposing the fact that how is it that you have so many girls missing and boys missing? in a city that has so many black owned businesses. People are constantly doing business with each other, events, you know, coming out, being aware, coming together, collaborating, but you're not collaborating about that topic right there that is so taboo to talk about, but it's happening. How is that not, you know, uh, something that's being talked about? Well, because the city is in on it and some of our people are in on it. A lot of the sex trafficking is taking place through the strip clubs where girls are being enticed to do it. They are kidnapping a lot of our people from different locations. You got a lot of our young sisters and young brothers meeting up with people from the internet, never coming back home. See, a lot of things are happening because some of our own people are involved. That's why it's not being talked about as much. I'm talking about the, the pimps don't look like they used to back then. Continue. It's bro. a different world now, bro. A lot of pimps are female. This is a thing we have to look at. A lot of pimps are female, a lot of pimps are male, and a lot of them are black male and females and they ain't and they're not extravagant bro and they're not no they're like, not we have a prototype of a pimp that no longer exists so when no. a person doesn't look like that they don't understand that you know everybody in bishop magic don juan everybody ain't out here with chains and hats and, and canes no you got you I'm, I'm talking i done ran a pimp off the block one time in la a honda civic and a t-shirt is what he had on so it's not what you think but again the point is a lot of our people are involved in it then the U.S. government is involved in it because it is feeding the bottom line, the actual financial system of America. You're talking about sex trafficking, brother, is not making hundreds of thousands, millions, not even tens of millions, billions of dollars in this industry. Sending children off to different countries and different nations. Sex trafficking through Atlanta, Georgia. Sex trafficking through different parts of Texas. Sex trafficking through Orange County. Sex trafficking through different parts of L.A., California, Florida. It is happening. 
and people are co-signing it. A lot of our people, our people are co-signing it. That's the thing that disturbed me. Um, I didn't really, I grew up with the whole, when every rapper was a pimp vibe, that mm-hmm. era, right? And I didn't really understand it, bro. I didn't really understand the game till I read Iceberg Slim's book mm-hmm. to really understand how deep the thing was. Like, I, I just didn't understand the concept of like, this lady was really giving this man all her money to go have sex with strangers. I don't think people fully understand that concept, you know, how wild it is in regards to the mental ma- manipulation, mm-hmm. how broken she is, the different tactics they use to keep them there. And it's like, it's pretty sick. And the issue I have with the artists that represent is like, man, it's just, I don't condone physical violence on people, mm-hmm. but like, I don't know, they're in that, they're in that area of uh, pedophiles with me in regards oh, yeah, to no, what they please, do, bro. you know? It has its place. See, it starts in the home. This is why black fathers matter. It is extremely important to have the father in the home. See, again, y'all can have your arguments. That's cool. Start co-parenting. Get over yourselves. You have children now. That's a whole life that you both came together with. Whether if you planned to or not, it happened. So now you have to get over your egos, get over whatever it is, and say for the betterment of this child, the future of our nation of people, we have to come together and do what is best for them. Why? Because that little girl, depending on how much love she gets or does not get from that man, is going to go out and seek it from somebody else. And if she doesn't get it properly right there, she's going to continue to get it improperly everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And then all those people that she meets, all that energy she collects, all that damaging transition, transition, transition is going to collect in her to where she is going to be a messed up individual. And she's going to be willing to do things that are so low down because all she knows is low down. She don't know nothing else. She doesn't know about her divine femininity. She doesn't know her connection to nature and her connection as a mother or the queen of civilization. She don't know about that. Nobody taught her that. They taught her this equals love. Sex is love. Money is love. Oh, okay. That's what she's taught. Fathers are important, bro. And then the sisters, the mothers have to be important when it comes to knowing exactly what to do with that too. Never allow your daughters to interact with men in a certain way. Don't just have her out there like that. Don't have yourself out there like that. She's looking at you and she's going to emulate what you do. Why? Because that's mama. That's my first example. Mama is God for a child at the very beginning. So we have to be mindful, you know, brother, of how we interact and how we operate around children because they develop and become what we are now dealing with in our society. They take over after we do. So whatever we put in them is going to be produced and is going to duplicate, replicate, and activate all out here. So if we don't like the way society is, we need to look at what the hell we are doing or not doing as parents. The uh, female pimps, are they using the same tactics as the men? Like, how are they Hmm. getting the women? I've talked to a few sisters, man. The tactics are different because males justify it for financial gain. And they feed the the women with, this is empowering. See, now you want to say, oh, it's empowering for you to go and sell yourself to give me my money. But the female pimps that I've noticed, they sell it as total empowerment and dominance over men. We control them. We control them with this. This is the power. It's sick. So you think by you giving yourself to me and I give you a couple of dollars, you won? (laughs) Really? No. You just devalue yourself more and more and more and more. And guess what? By the time you have a baby or two children, you're in your mid thirties, early forties. Now you start realizing, well, man, I actually want to settle down. I want to go to school. I want to do something with my life. You have a whole record of being in the street. Everybody know you by your hood name, your street name. They know you by your stripper name. And you're trying to do your best to get away from that. Now your children are looking at you. Now your children are going to school and they're hearing about their mama. They're hearing about the past. They're hearing about this. They know... The whole hood knows who you are. You try to move somewhere. Your face is now because it's on video now. Now you got OnlyFans. Let's talk about that part because now that's a form of trafficking too, to be very clear, because a lot of those things ain't consensual. A lot of those things too. Same with the porn industry. A lot of times it's not consensual. That's another thing people are not realizing here. A lot of the sex trafficking, the pimping, the prostituting, a lot of that stuff is by a level of force and duress. People who have no idea how deep this is, bro. So when you're getting through all that stuff, now you're recorded. You're digital now. Your face is all over the world. Now you're trying to live life normally, and no one's letting you get past that. You join, you going to church. Okay, yeah, you there. You there. But the pastor, 
used to watch you too. He did. And you know, and it's like, okay, well, some people are like, well, yeah, but all she can blame is herself. No, I, I don't I don't do that. I don't just say, well, the sisters is all your fault. No, it's not all her fault. Because when she was a child, she didn't know all this stuff. She was conditioned, just like us as young brothers. We were conditioned. I was taught how to crip walk before I even knew how to talk in many words, bro. So no, the environment and what we do or what we don't do as a people, as parents, is what conditions this situation and what creates this environment. And then of course, we have the system that you know does what it does, but we know what the system does. We can't blame that all day long. We have to look at ourselves now at this point because now we're looking at a future where this generation is, you're gonna see everything now. Can you, can you uh, briefly break down the connection between the sex trafficking, the porn industry, mm -hmm. and the OnlyFans? Oh yeah. They're all intertwined financially is the number one goal with all of that. The porn industry, a lot of those people, like I said, it's not consensual. So you have everything now from people who look like women. So you got that whole, that's a whole industry now that's blowing up. You got that. You have people who look like they are consenting adults, 18. A lot of them are not. You have that. And then you have the money being made by the views and the subscribers and all of that. So you have all of that going on. The porn industry is a, is a monster. Then that goes into and feeds the sex trafficking, that situation, because a lot of it is overseas. A lot of it gets recorded out at Miami is a big area for it. Houston, Texas is another area for it. Atlanta, Georgia is another area for it. Hollywood, California. I'm talking about where they do these recordings and they make a lot of money. The advertisers get paid because like people, when you, when you hear about a business like the prison industrial complex, there's a lot of investors in that. The porn industry, there's a lot of investors in that. The ads for the different pills, the ads for the toys, the ads for the different, you know, scents and stuff like that. You have advertisers, they're all making money. And then in between that, the OnlyFans, where people think, oh good, now I have this under my control. Wait a minute, you're now putting yourself in front of men, digitally, and women, for this amount of money. Now it's a subscription based. So now you got people getting off and all that nasty stuff to you, not realizing, guess what? This is living forever. It will never go away. You can delete everything from your computer. It's on everybody else's. Man, that's facts. I saw an interview with a young lady that was uh, a victim of sex trafficking, right? And mm -hmm. she was saying, and she's like, eh, I don't think a decade, but say like six years removed from the experience. Mm -hmm. She was saying the stuff's still on the internet. She said she, her lawyers then got involved, bro. They done sent all the emails and the thing is still on the internet. It's something called reputation management. Do you have reputation management companies um, who... Their job is to go through the internet, send through certain systems, now they're using AI to remove things that you don't want to be on the internet. Articles, videos, whatever. Um, this is why when I wrote my book, <laughs> I told people in chapter two on social media, do not put on social media what you do not want to see of yourself later. Don't. Do your best not to do that. Rezaislam.com. And now you have people who are, they're, they're angry with themselves because they keep seeing a person who was them that they're no longer. And they're saying, I've evolved past that. I don't want to see that. But again, it, it's impossible. You can't regulate it anymore. It's a monster. It's really, that's what it is. So now again, that's why a lot of women uh, on, are stopping the OnlyFans thing. A lot of men are stopping the OnlyFans thing because they're realizing this is destroying my life in real life. The internet is not just some separate world. It's together now. Like it's really together now. You know, and that's the thing. You got people talking the same way they, they abbreviate on text messages and on, on posts. They're talking the same way, LOL. Like, LOL, but we in person, brother. What are you? <laughs> so it lets me know where your head is. You're still stuck in that world. So it, it's all connected, brother. And it's a deep thing that has to be addressed. The more people address it, the more we'll stop because it's getting younger and younger and younger. Now, and I'm going to end on this point, you have groups of very disgusting men and women too, some women too who travel overseas to certain nations to have intercourse with children as young as one. I'm telling you. I've, I've heard about it, right? Yes. And I just didn't, I, didn't, I don't understand what takes place. Like, what yeah. do you do? Other nations that don't have strict laws. No, I mean, yeah. like, sexually, like, what do they do? Yeah. Like, that's what I don't understand. Yeah. Like, it's There have just... been reports. I've seen reports. I've seen these things, brother, not just with documentaries, but people who are involved in these things, where they, you, you have 
You have sick men, like we talked about the pedophile circumstance. You have a lot of these sick individuals who have fantasies of, of doing things that are so harmful to children. That as you said, although, yeah, we don't believe in physical violence, but it does have its place when it comes to people like that. They have a sick fetish, bro, where they have, they think of what, to, what can I do to that child, that baby? And you have some people who act out on that. See, those are the kind of people that, no, you can try to say pray for it. No, 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 no. Examples have to be made in order for certain things to stop. Because other nations of people won't talk about it. They're going to be about it. You're not going to come over here and just do that. You see? And that's something that has to be addressed. That's, I'm talking about that devil side of people that, that activates itself. You have to address it and stop it and let the world know you cannot do this. And if, that, if it comes out more, then there'll be less of that stuff happening. But as long as we continue to, you know, Makuchi Ping, Mabudi O'Brien, okay. Okay. You do know that that's happening all over the world and you're only perpetuating and helping that to grow, right? You know, uh, yeah. you mentioned the evil side of people. Do you think man is naturally good or is man's natural state what it is, what it's been demonstrating to be? Mm. Man, I believe, is naturally good. The original man. We got original people. Now, <laughs> you can manipulate. You can create a Frankenstein's monster, if you will. You drop somebody in this environment the way it is right now, oh, you're going you're gonna to get a reflection of this environment. You'll get a two-year-old playing with a gun irresponsibly, you know, sagging, trying to say the words that they hear on TV or social media. But if you have them in their basic natural state and you have the environment set up. Properly socialized. Properly socialized to where they can walk into what is natural culturally, then it's going to be of benefit to the people because that's all we really had as a natural culture. Outside of any negative things, it was really... What is beneficial for the man, the woman, the children, for society, things that help the society, not things that destroy it. Why? Because that's not beneficial to the culture. That's not beneficial to society. That's not natural. So that side of people, that devil side of us, we have to put in check. You just have to for the benefit of society. So man, I believe is basically good. Absolutely. I don't agree with the Catholic Church and all that. And man is born in original sin. Yeah, well, because they manipulated that story, but they can make you know, do things with little boys and they say, that's good, but, but man, is it, no, nah, I, I don't, all of that nonsense, if you allow a person to be in their natural state, they will be good, but you have to set up the environment to make it so. It's like the womb of the woman. Her womb, if she eats the proper foods and she does the proper things to make sure her body is prepared, her mind is prepared, her spirit is prepared, then the womb is going to produce what it's naturally made to produce, which is a healthy child. We have to do the same thing with the environment after that child is born from that womb. We need to construct the womb of society to make sure things are put in place to where the nature of the child is able to flourish, prosper, and grow. Uh, I heard you say numerous times that Scientology is a great technology, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why do you refer to it as a technology, and why do you believe it's so good? When I say technology, I'm referring to the steps and the practices, their ability to break things down in steps, specifically. A lot of times, you know, you have things that are not broken down in steps, and a lot of things are. But the more specific you can be, the more technical. You can put things A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. Okay, the easier things can be followed. Um, I have studied this technology for years. And the thing that I notice is one, they give credit to the original people because everything in it, when you study it, you can be like, oh, yeah, that's ancient comedic science. Oh, that's Islam. Oh, yeah, that's history from the Bible. Oh, yeah, that's it. You'll be able to, you'll be able to pull it out and say, okay, that's that, 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 that. And I've done that with them. And I say, oh, yeah, that's here. That's there. So as a researcher, I study everything. I study everything. It's just a lot of people are afraid because they hear a word and they hear somebody talk about it. And I laugh. I'm like, brother, I've actually studied their books. I've read their books. See, as a scholar, all of our great leaders, they read. They read. Whether it was a white author or a black author, they're going to read. As a matter of fact, if it was a white author, most of our greats studied them even more because they knew they will put the lies in there or the truth in there and say, well, just study this over here. No, we knew what they were doing. They were hiding it in the books. So even if, they, even if your motive is just to go and study that to see what you could find wrong, cool, but study it. Because if you don't study something, you can't argue intellectually about it. I know about that. And I can't lie about it. I'm not going to lie. See, the white man don't need help lying. 
he did that long enough. We can point at all the lies he's done. But when it comes to that technology, what I've seen thus far, so far, yeah, definitely useful. You know, but that ain't my religion. If that's something that you want to go as a religion, that's you. But you, definitely um, the books have useful information. Just be more specific in regards to why is it useful or things in it that are useful to people. Oh, yeah. For example, a lot of the things that I've noticed that they have are basic self-help things that you see in all other groups. Self-help things. For example, they have things dealing with taking care of the environment. Okay. Simple stuff. Non-religious. I mean, like literally just taking right, care like of the Eight principles. Yeah, called? they have. Yeah, they have. Uh, there are twenty-one precepts, twenty-one principles of living. They have take care of yourself, don't be promiscuous, safeguard the environment, just basic stuff. It's like, okay, and I'm I'm reading critically now to see where is the what you about to what you gonna slide up in here. I haven't seen nothing as of yet. See, now that's the sad part. I don't like when a person is not factual with their criticism. If you're going to critique something, then critique it from a basis of facts, not because, oh, well, I heard. No, 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 Negro, stop with the I heard. The gossip is a god to a lot of people. Go study it so that way you can actually debate it from I studied this and this is where I found this. Cool, go do that. And I'm not talking about from the Internet. I've actually read the books physically, the books. And that's that's what I'm saying. So, again, there are people who use that. Same way as we use the Holy Quran, same way we use the Bible, we use historical books or whatever. If it works for you, it works for you. So why do people have such a big issue with you and science theology then? Like, what's the big issue? Well, I've just seen people who had an issue. They were just questioning, why did I study it? But I'd be laughing like, wow. Christianity conquered the planet using a sword and a white man's image. But I could read the Bible and the majority of you are cool with that. See, I don't like that. My deal is go and study something if anything that's in it helps you. Cool. Many of us went to college or just high school and had white teachers. Did you argue with your white teacher every day? Let me ask you that. I just want to know this real quick because a lot of you got degrees. I don't have one, but you got degrees from a white man's university and you do not argue about that. I got my degree, brother, because of what? What justification can you use? See, I don't study things and say, well, I did it because no, I just studied it. And that's very simple as a research. And I'm going to study everything. I say it this way. The Anmus was far Khan, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad said that we are to master the science of everything and study everything, especially if it's in our community. If our people have something like that in our community, at bare minimum, it's my duty to go investigate what the hell is that in my community. I, at um, least. I can relate. I read a broad range of things, even our religious texts I don't believe in, but I do read, right? Mm -hmm. But what I notice is that, like, I'll use Christianity, for example. Most Christians have never read the Bible. That's their, true. Their only uh, exposure to the Bible is what the pastor says. Yes. Or Psalms. and That's like the famous book in the Bible for Psalms and Proverbs. They like stop yes. there with the little hymns yes. or whatever. But like most people don't study what they proclaim to believe in or will mm -hmm. even argue with you about and defend. Yes. They don't clearly understand it. So I just think it's a it's just a cultural thing where people don't study. No, that's that's a fact. Begin, uh, now remember this again. Let's go back to the epigenetics. Reading cost us our life. If we were caught reading a book, we would die. That's normally how it went. Foot chopped off, tongue cut out, something. So when the other slaves saw that, or our people saw that, they would equate reading or intelligence or knowledge with death, harm, pain. Okay, don't read, don't study. Good. Don't read, don't study. But I'm going to criticize all of those that do read and study. Hold on, bro. <laughs> Just wait a minute here. I'm going to read any and everything. I've had conversation with Klansmen. Do you want to be a Klansman? No, 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 no. Know your enemy. See, you, most of our people are not willing to really have that smoke like they have for one another. If you want to say, I don't trust this system, justify it then. Find out why. Have you studied foreign policy? Do you know what government is? Do you know how many congressmen there are? Do you know the Congress representative of your state? Do you know what a mayor is? Do you have any idea who any of these people are and any type of capacity in politics, in religion, anywhere. Learn, learn, and learn. My deal is, brother, I'm going to continue studying any and everything without it being my religion. It's very simple. I wear this suit. This is an Italian-made suit. I'm not Italian. Uh, it's very simple. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But again, I'm not going to push anything that's not my religion. My religion is Islam. 
I'm a nation of Islam. That's just what it is. But I definitely am going to study everything because I have to master the knowledge of all this stuff. I have to. And not only that, but I need to be able to converse with my people in every area. A lot of our people are Christians. I got to know the Bible. A lot of my Muslim, I got to know the Holy Quran. You got some black folks in Scientology. All right. I got to learn that at least to talk your language. Committed our brothers in the Moorish Science Temple. I got to learn about that. Hebrew Israelites, I got to learn about that. Sorry. But I'm not going to be in no damn little box because a person is afraid because they heard somebody say this. You can keep hearing people on YouTube. YouTube wasn't made by a black man, but you're using it. <laughs> so let's, let's come on, man. What advice would you give to people who, are, who struggle with criticism? Focus on your work. One reason why people are so affected by critics, one is because you're not certain about the mission you're on, bro. Bro. <laughs> you're not certain about what you're really doing. Listen. <laughs> Could, can I just stop it? Go ahead, please. Bro? Me and my Bridget, we have a podcast called Ball Head in the Dread, right? And mm -hmm. we speak about that. And like what I've experienced in my life, Christians who are uncertain about their faith yes. are the most rowdy people, bro. Yes. They just fly off the handle because one, they can't defend it. No. And now I'm shaking their little, you know, their yeah, shaky that, table yeah, because it's like they truly don't believe. But I've had long conversations, no arguing. Mm -hmm. with people who truly believe yes and we can have an intellectual conversation back and forth with no emotion and no excitement mm -hmm. so you really expose yourself when you get excited about certain things but continue that's yes. a brilliant statement I, <laughs> i'm gonna tell you something man just just the honorable minister was farrakhan he said a wise man respects his critics what advice would you give to people who are who struggle with criticism focus on your work one reason why people are so affected by critics, one is because you're not certain about the mission you're on, bro. Bro. <laughs> you're not certain about what you're really doing. Listen, <laughs> could, can I just stop it? Go ahead, check, please. <laughs> Me and my Bridget, we have a podcast called Ball Head and the Dread, right? And mm -hmm. we speak about that. And like what I've experienced in my life, Christians who are uncertain about their faith yes. are the most rowdy people bro yes. they just fly off the handle because one they can't defend it no. and now i'm shaking their little you know their yeah, shaky that, table yeah, because it's like they truly don't believe but i've had long conversations no arguing mm -hmm. with people who truly believe yes and we can have an intellectual conversation back and forth with no emotion and no excitement mm -hmm. so you really expose yourself when you get excited about certain things but continue that's yes. a brilliant statement I, <laughs> i'm gonna tell you something man just just the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, he said a wise man respects his critics because critics quite often will be more honest with you than your best friend. They'll tell you the things that you don't want to hear. They'll tell you there's a bug in your nose. Your friend says you all good. They'll tell you your damn jacket is wrinkled. And your best friend, nah, man, you all good. No, 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 no. Your critics are going to tell you some things that maybe you need to look into because if you are kind of halfway on some things, you're not too good over here. Don't you want somebody to tell you that? so that you could sharpen up on it and tighten up on it. I, I appreciate my critics because the one thing is, you're not going to outwork me. Just get out here and do the work. I let my work speak. I don't need to argue with anyone. Now, those who I do have smoke for, those who I will debate, those who I will come at when it comes to anything dealing with this are those who represent this enemy, who push agendas and things that destroy our people, that bring our people down, that bring our people into a level of destruction. Those are the ones I got smoke for. Our people, I have nothing but love for, including the ignorant ones. And I do appreciate all of you, especially if you ever pull up to any event in person. I will lovingly hug you, embrace you. Don't ever try to run up to do anything stupid because you will get that love too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> in a loving way the second part was like um in preparation for the interview obviously i watched a lot of interviews and mm -hmm. um, i saw some debates i don't know why you did them me personally mm -hmm. i thought they were kind of pointless mm -hmm. but i saw one i won't mention the person's name but i was appreciative and impressed by the poise you had and the calmness you had when the person was be being very disrespectful mm -hmm. and i think it was great for the brothers to see that you don't have to get rowdy because another person is getting rowdy and you don't have no. to get disrespectful or use profanity. So I thought that was a great demonstration. Um, there's a gentleman I used to work with at the school and I saw him demonstrate this when a student was going bananas. I had to tell him after, bro, like I have a lot of patience, mm -hmm. but the way they were conducting themselves, bro, <laughs> it would have ran out. You know what I'm saying? So like I always tell the brothers that I'm impressed with like that display of patience when people mm -hmm. are um, out of hand. I just say it this way, brother, a person, um, if you can be controlled by the words of a person, you become their slave. It's very simple. 
the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said that self-mastery is the most difficult task, the mastery of self. This is a hard thing to do. It's easy to attack people, go off and all that, but it is very hard to control your mouth, control your anger, your emotions, control your thoughts. It's not an easy thing to do, especially when you're being attacked from all sides. I've been attacked by our own people heavily. In certain instances, I received the vast majority of love from our people. I say there's probably like a half a percent, you know, who criticize me. But even they have learned to respect me. You know, with my case recently being dismissed, for example, a lot of people were running with the accusation. I received six plea deal offers. I was fighting this case for 10 years. I turned down every plea deal because I will never agree to say I'm guilty of something that I did not do. And the court finally agreed and buckled because I said, no, I didn't do this. And they said, we don't have the evidence to move forward in case was dismissed. Real quick, how much was the money they claim was uh, uh, received? Oh, the oh yeah. They were saying something about three or four million dollars. Some didn't. It wasn't dealing with me. It was a whole group of people. No, I understand. But, but like, was why really, was the case? Do you believe your uh, presence on social media played the role in the case being spread out so long? My case. Like, wait, eight years. Yeah, I was supposed to be taken off the case seven years ago. Yeah, my my first attorney told me that they were going to take me off the case, but they Googled me. Goddamn Google! Yeah. They Googled me, and they said, "Oh, he's a little out there. He's you know he's doing a lot more than than we thought." So they brought in one. They brought us to the higher floor. We were on a floor that was much lower, uh, not a high priority floor, nothing like that. They brought us up to the ninth floor in L.A. Anybody who knows that floor in the court in downtown L.A., that's the same floor where Harvey Weinstein's case was just tried. Same floor, same courtrooms where Tory Lane's case just happened. Same floor, same courtrooms where the killer of Nipsey Hussle was. As a matter of fact, the same judge who handled my case is the one who handled, tried and convicted the killer of Nipsey Hussle. And it was right next door to the courtroom of O.J. Simpson. They brought in the media at that time because that's where the media goes. And then they started trying to drum up this whole story and brought in Channel 7 and all of that. That never happened before. Before that, it was just they were going to take me off the case because there was a group of people. We were all working at the same organization. And so they said he doesn't, there's no evidence that he did anything dealing with none of this. So we're going to take him off the case. That was it. But after that, they tried to, they said, no, we're going to keep him on, make it bigger because he's a social media influencer is what they said. He has a social presence. And then they tried to make it big, bring in religious groups and ties and I mean, they really like tried to create this big thing, bro. It was so, bad. So, um, how much time were they trying to give you? Oh, I've been like I said, six plea deal offers. First time that they offered was, they said, uh, you know, if you're found guilty, you'll get, I think it was five years, yeah, four to five years, something like that. And you know, when you get out, whatever. And then the plea deal offer, they said, well, two years and a thousand hours, and uh, I think a year and a half probation, something like that. Then third plea deal went down. Fourth plea deal went down to a year. Fifth plea deal went down to, you know, half a year. Felony on your record. They just kept, I said, no. Every time I was like, no. Because, again, you got to be certain. I did not do what you accused me of. So the burden of proof is on the state. You have to prove this. So they just kept going, kept going, kept going. Until the last plea deal, they said, look, no jail time, all right? You're not going to go to jail. Just, just accept the plea. And um, no jail, but you will have a felony on your record. After one year, you can come back. We'll expunge it, bring it down to a misdemeanor, and, and that'll be it. My attorney, the, my private attorney who I hired, Jeremy McLamont of a Celia law firm, he said, oh, I didn't even tell you about it, you know, because I know we're not taking that. We're going to take them to task. We went into that courtroom the first day that was supposed to be the trial date. Channel 7 didn't even show up because they knew it was about to go down. We got in front of that judge, and the prosecutor said, your Honor, we don't have evidence to move forward. It's been nearly 10 years, and you don't have evidence to prove this man guilty of what you have been bad. You've been, you've been going off in the media about me, and you don't have any proof of what you're saying? That judge said, case dismissed in five minutes. You ain't heard nobody who was talking about me lying, that whole accusation. Nobody's back on social media saying, you know what? We've been pushing that line accusation, but case was dismissed. Congratulations. Y'all all quiet. And like, bro, what's the lower f <laughs> lawyer fees on it? Was it pro bono or what was the? No, it was not. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, that's I wish grind. it were pro bono. You yeah. know what? I'm going to give a shout out to, to the people. Because although I got a few people privately who helped, you know, because my with my money, I had to bleed my accounts dry, bro. Yeah. I went completely broke to pay for my lawyer fees. Yeah. 
the people. I had to reach out for support from the people and the people. This is why I will never abandon our people. Right. Ever. I will never abandon our people because the people have been there for me. They helped to pay for the last amount of the lawyer fees, but it was over 20 grand easy for the lawyer fees. And I was able to pay my lawyer in full. His whole team shut down the, the whole, they shut down everything just to address my case because he said, no, I, we, he said, I cannot allow this to happen. You are a good brother. We've known you for years. We've been seeing the work you've been doing for years. So we have to do this. But again, you know, they, they have to live too. So, you know, but we had to come up with that money we did. And again, shout out to the people. You know, my love is for y'all and I will continue to do the work that I can to help y'all. Farrakhan gave you any advice on the case? Oh, yeah. Yeah, as he always has given us yeah. advice on all this. But throughout the years, yes, saw his counsel, you know, and uh, we believe in Allah, bro. I believe in I believe in God so deeply that even if I did go to jail, I'd be okay with it because I truly believe that it's in Allah's plan. We plan and Allah plans and we believe Allah's the best of planners. If that's what he wanted me to do, then I will do that. But he saw fit. No, our brother didn't do that. So you will not be going to jail. Did you ever read a book called God and His Bankers by Gerald Posner? I've heard of it. I have not read it. Bugged out book. All right, anyone watching this, please read the book. Um, I wanted to ask, does the Vatican still hold the same power it did in the 19th and 20th, 20th century? I would say it holds similar power. It may not hold the same exact level of influence. Not publicly. <laughs> I'll say it that way. Not publicly. Financially, yes. Uh, when it comes to certain policies, when it comes to certain leadership, Vatican is still one, it's its own entity. So people need to know about the Vatican. So you need to know about Vatican as an entity, Vatican as it pertains to how it influences banking, Vatican as it pertains to how it influences relations, as it pertains to its religious, you know, powerhouse when it comes to the actual Pope and all that. So it still has major influential power over world leadership in particularly. The people for the most part in this generation, they ain't think about no, you know, no Vatican stuff like that. But it does have a level of influence. They still have a lot of our artifacts. They still have a lot of uh, influence over the property, people. bro. <laughs> it, it, lots of property. Oh, yeah. Indigenous property. I mean, man, I'm, I'm looking at these people and I'm thinking, OK, so the Queen of England, you know, I'm thinking of France. I'm thinking of Germany. I'm thinking of all of the colonial powers, the Vatican, you know, the the Pope of Rome. You not only the apology, because we, we appreciate the apology by the Pope. Um, the recent one, I believe he apologized for the last 2000 years of what the Catholic Church has done to the indigenous people. That sounds nice. Great apology. Now, give back the money, the the rights to the indigenous land, um, acknowledge the negatives that you have dealt when it comes to the transatlantic slave trade, the negatives when it comes to the colonization of Africa, the negatives that as it pertains to your influence over the indigenous lands and the native reservations in America. OK, all of that, the papal bulls that you put down the official edicts and directives to go and conquer those who are what you refer to as savages, because savages technically can't own land because they're not technically classified as human beings. So the papal bulls that came from the popes, you have to rescind all of that and then look at the damage it caused, estimate it, give the money back, the land back, everything. See, that's a full apology, but just that all, please forgive us. No, 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 sir. <laughs> Sounds nice, but give it all back. Same thing with England. They, they all have to. They all have to. I don't think people understand the history of England. That's why they like got this infatuation with the queen. Yes, but please. I, I wanted to say she's still on a lot of their money too. <laughs> Last thing. Yes. Um, what the heck is in the Vatican libraries, and do you think that it will ever become available to the public? Mm -hmm. The Vatican libraries, um, with the six to eight miles, I believe, roughly of storage space underneath. That's crazy, bro. Six to eight miles. Don't 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 say that lightly. Like, okay. It's okay. Miles <laughs> of storage space. Um, everything from the, the Black Madonna, which we know that's been public, but a lot of the gold, a lot of the original artifacts, a lot of the books that they took from Africa. They didn't just burn down all of the libraries. They stole a lot of that because they had to figure out how did these people who we call savages construct these buildings? How did they construct all of this? We had high scientific artifacts and structures. All throughout Africa. We, they did not find us swinging in the trees with bones in our noses like they told the world they did. They were trying to figure out how in the hell did these people build this? Take those books, as many as we can carry now, burn the rest so that they can't recover them, and we're going to study them. So a lot of that is a large amount of historical things that they have there. Um, and they, again, they still have that influence, which is why 
you can't just go there and gain access. There have been people who tried to say, hey, I just want to go downstairs and see what's under there. And they're like, no, you can't have access to that. You can't go there. I believe at a certain point, it will be the children of the cardinals, the children of the pope, the children of the bloodline who are because of their multicultural appeal, because of their black friends, their indigenous friends, you know, who they are saying in regards to them and their family and what we have done, we have to make this right. And they're going to make it public. They're going to give back at least a good percentage, I believe. It's going to come through the younger generation, not the older ones. Because the younger generation right now, they are more connected to other people. So I believe at a certain point it will. You know, the balance is going to happen. God is going to make it right. The first, uh, the, those who were last will be first. It's very simple. It's going to go back to the way it needs to be.